Good evening, everyone. This meeting is now in session. Would you all please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Career Center, Air Force, JROTC. Please be seated. I think our JROTC program is thriving. It's wonderful, very exciting. Uh, tonight, we are recognizing Hispanic Heritage Month. From September 15th to October 15th, APS joins in the National His Hispanic Heritage Month celebration. In doing so, we commemorate Hispanic heritage and honor the achievements of Hispanics in the United States and specifically in our Arlington community. Today, the school board is proud to recognize students who in their own distinct ways influence and enrich our diverse school system in a positive manner. Dr. Burphy, would you like to take over? Yes, uh, thank you. I'm gonna give a little bit of uh, some additional background. First, I wanna welcome everyone here this evening. I wanna make a special thank you to the many uh, principals and program managers that are here, as well as the families who have come out in support of our outstanding leaders uh, this has become a uh, tradition here in Arlington as a part of celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. And what we do is we ask our principals and program leaders from many of the secondary schools to uh, identify leaders in their school. And so that's who you'll be seeing, some of the leaders in our school. And I wanna turn to Gladys Baudouin, who's going to uh, lead us through this program in recognizing students. Dr. Murphy, if I could interrupt for just a moment, we do have translation available, I see. So if anyone in the audience, and maybe someone can help me with the Spanish, um, want to mention to make sure everyone who would like it has access to translation. I, yes. I was okay. just going to say that. So oh. You took the words out of my mouth. Thank Sorry. you. Great minds think alike. <laughs> um, before we begin, I'd like to thank Soraya Stroback. There she is from the Language Services Registration Center for providing Spanish interpretation services. Si alguna persona necesita interpretación, yo creo que ya he hablado con muchos de ustedes. Los audífonos están en la mesa de afuera, pero creo que todos estamos bien. Pero si necesitan, el, un set está afuera. Ah, gracias. Sí. Oh, ¿la oyen bien? ¿Pueden escuchar así? Ok, gracias. Thank you, Dr. Murphy, school board and executive leadership. Good evening, students, families, administrators, faculty and staff, friends and community members. Thank you for being here as we honor the leadership and achievement of our high school student leaders. Our heritage is important. Our traditions, our history, our values, our culture and customs allow us to understand where we come from to make connections, 
and provide a roadmap for our collective future. To our students, congratulations on being recognized as a leader in your school and in this entire community. Embrace this honor because, well, you deserve it. <laughs> you have great responsibility. Others will see themselves in you. They're gonna feel inspired by you. They're gonna feel pride and they're gonna gain the hope and the strength to also do great things. As a leader, always raise the bar high for yourself because you will be doing so for others as well. I'd like to ask school board members Nancy Van Doren and Tanya Talento to join me up front. We're gonna congratulate our students and then present them with certificates, please. Thank you. Students, I'm gonna call each of you forward alphabetically by last name and ask that you remain standing up front We'll take a group photo with Dr. Murphy and the entire board thereafter. Thank you. We, be, we begin with Cesar Alvarado from Yorktown High School. <laughs> Cesar? Cesar is a Minority Student Achievement Network, AMSAN, leader at Yorktown. In this role, Caesar meets regularly with other AMSAN student leaders to plan events for its membership and represented Yorktown at this year's AMSAN student conference. He has also participated in the Student Seed, Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity, which is an eight-week program that meet, meets during lunch to discuss issues of race and equity with a group of students. Cesar moved through four levels of HILT, the high intensity language training, in three years and is now preparing for college. Caesar is a gifted artist focusing on ceramics. In addition to his heavy course load and extracurricular activities, Cesar works part time. He is family oriented and connected to his community. You're a star. Congratulations. <laughs> Natalie Arandia Gutierrez from Washington Lee High School. <laughs> Natalie has proven to be an outstanding student and role model to others. She's a people person, always willing to help others, and does it all with a smile and gusto. Last year, in her AB Business class, Natalie was instrumental in working on a partnership with the Boeing Company to conduct business simulations. Her teacher reported that Natalie stood out because of her leadership, determination, and commitment to hard work. Natalie is definitely best defined as a go-getter with a lot of passion. These leadership skills are demonstrated in her active role as a member of Washington Lee's Latin American Student Association. We're proud of your accomplishments, and we look forward to all that you stand to accomplish in the future. Congratulations. Sarah Duran Calzada from Arlington Career Center Ac Academic Academy. Sarah is an 11th grader. She was born in El Salvador and came to the U.S. at the age of four. Life has presented many challenges for Sarah. She recalls often going home after school and crying to her mother because school was simply too hard for her. Her mom would look at her and tell her that you're capable of anything if you put your mind to it. With the support and motivation of her teachers, she has blossomed into the leader she was always destined to be. Sarah works in the evenings to support herself and her baby Zoe. She wants to become a registered nurse and so far has taken courses on medical terminology, physical therapy, and EMT at the, career at the Career Center. Sarah knows she's capable of everything that she sets her mind to. Congratulations. <laughs> Jordan Gorms, Langston Secondary Program. Jordan's first love in school be began in the music department. 
He started in band and then eventually evolved to participate in an extracurricular advanced choir group. Jordan has performed at the Kennedy Center and in the Festival of Music Competition at King's Dominion. In addition to his appreciation of music, Jordan loves to volunteer. He has volunteered at a summer camp and through the Family Career and Community Leaders of America. He holds a certification from the Enlightened Initiative Camp, which prepares minorities to advance their futures by developing strong leadership skills. He believes that people from different countries can learn from each other. Jordan's hopes and expectations are to graduate from high school and to travel to explore new cultures while studying our similarities and differences. Jordan's dreams for your future are limitless. Congratulations. Jonathan Hernandez from Wakefield High School. Jonathan has outstanding ac academics and extracurricular involvement. He will graduate with a GPA over 4.0. He has taken rigorous classes throughout his high school career, has been a member of the National Honor Society since sophomore year, a member of the Principal's Honor Roll, and a four-year member of the cohort program. Jonathan has also been very involved with St. Charles Borromeo Catholic Church. Through the church, he has participated in several service work camps, similar to Habitat for Humanity. He has been an altar boy and helped with food services for the parishioners. His extracurricular activities include the Spanish Honor Society as treasurer, a model UN, and its academic. Jonathan has was selected to participate in the Leadership Arlington Youth Program and is a semi-finalist for a Posse Scholarship. Congratulations. Rodrigo Hernandez Martinez from Arlington Community High School. Rodrigo has been a valued student since entering as a ninth grader in 2013. This year, he's graduating. He has been dedicated to completing his high school diploma while working to support himself. Through Career Center courses, he's completed, he has completed electricity courses, competed in Skills USA at the national level, and holds electrical certifications. Originally from El Salvador, Rodrigo places value on his education and service to his community. He has a strong sense of social justice and works to support others in need. He is an officer of the Key Club where he advocates to provide student scholarships. He plans on attending NOVA and eventually completing a four-year degree. Congratulations. Miguel Ramirez from the New Directions program. Miguel arrived at New Directions doubting his strengths and abilities to be personally and academically successful. In the one year, he has taken responsibility of his actions and has invested in positive personal and academic change. His challenges were many. And one by one, he has overcome them to be the amazing young adult he is today. Through the support of his family and Arlington Public Schools and his willingness to grow as a person and extend his horizons, Miguel is on track to graduate with an advanced diploma. Miguel plans to return to Washington Lee for his senior year. Currently, he's ex exploring his passion for photography by being enrolled in the Career Center's photo and video course. He works a part-time job and has given back to the community with volunteer hours at Oak Ridge Elementary School. Miguel's future is bright. We look forward to hearing of the amazing things that you will accomplish. Congratulations. <laughs> Alan Villanueva from HB Woodlawn. Alan is originally from Honduras. He arrived in the United States three years ago to reunite with his family here. 
When Alan enrolled in the H.B. Woodlawn Hilt program, he spoke almost no English, but staff knew right away he was driven to succeed. Through his hard work and self-discipline, Alan progressed very quickly with his English and other classes, earning excellent grades all along the way. He achieved all of this while working many hours each week in order to help support his family. Two years ago, Alan suffered a terrible accident and he was not expected to survive. With the help of his family and his sheer determination, here he is today, a senior, excelling with a demanding schedule with two AP classes, a job, SAT preparation, the dream project, and making his plans for college next year. We're so proud of you. Congratulations. And now we can have a photo, please. <laughs> Thank you. All of you, yes, please, the board. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Antes que se vayan, por favor, un momento, before you leave, yeah. just one second. <laughs> Come back, everyone, please. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to um, give the floor to Ms. Talento. I, I just, um, in honoring Hispanic Heritage Month, as many of you know, my family's from Guatemala. They immigrated here, and I was born here, so I'm Latina all the way, um, Latina Americana. And I just wanted to take a moment to tell you how proud I am to recognize you today. Last week, I had the honor of attending the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's 40th anniversary awards gala. Never in my life have I been surrounded by so many Latino leaders. And as a person growing up here with many challenges, it was a phenomenal experience for me and inspiring. And to be here tonight and to see all of you being acknowledged is the similar feeling of being inspired. Because sometimes, as a leader, it's a lonely road. But it is an amazing path. And all of you have been acknowledged for that leadership. And I look forward to your journey and know that even if you find yourself alone sometimes, there is always other people fighting and advocating to make this country the great country it's supposed to be for all of us all over the country. Quería tomar un momento para decirles estoy tan orgullosa de estar aquí esta noche con ustedes celebrando su liderazgo. La semana pasada yo tuve la oportunidad de atender el Congressional Hispanic Caucus El, donde estaba reconociendo tres latinos famosos y era un montón de latinos y nunca en mi vida he estado yo con tantos latinos que eran líderes en nuestra comunidad y me sentí tan inspirada y esta noche vuelvo a sentirme inspirada reconociendo a todos ustedes que también son líderes y les quería decir que yo sé que unas veces ese, ese camino de liderazgo es un camino bien solo pero sepan que en este país hay muchos de nosotros en ese camino de liderazgo que nos sentimos solos, pero no estamos solos. 
por todo el país, a líderes, luchando para que este país sea un país bueno para todos. Y estoy, tengo tanto honor estar aquí esta noche, siendo latina, estando en la Junta Directiva, reconociéndolas a ustedes. Gracias, gracias, gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Talento. And we have one more special recognition tonight that we're all very excited about. Um, I'd like to ask our Wakefield Social Studies teacher, Michelle Cottrell Williams, um, to come forward. She is our Arlington Teacher of the Year. We then found out she was the Region 4 Teacher of the Year, which we'll explain in a moment. And as of Monday, she is the Virginia Teacher of the Year. Yeah, and if you don't mind just standing there, and, and perhaps, uh, Dr. Wilmore, you could join Michelle at the front here. Um, it's a team effort, and of course, um, there are many team players. I just want to quickly say, um, several of us, Dr. Murphy, I, um, Mr. Goldstein, Ms. Talento, a number of others, and the First Lady of Virginia, Dorothy McAuliffe, surprised Ms. Cottrell Williams in her classroom last Monday, a week ago last Monday, in front of her students. She did not know what was going on, but we all walked in. Dr. Wilmore came first, and, um, and, and Ms. McAuliffe told her that she had won the Region 4 Teacher of the Year. That is, she represents 19 school districts in Northern Virginia, so that alone is a huge accomplishment. And by the way, what I've learned over um, uh, watching this process is there's a lot that, that you had to prepare, um, and, and maybe you can talk about that a little bit, but then on Monday, Dr. Murphy and I and Dr. Wilmore and others joined Michelle and her family, her beautiful family and friends um, in Richmond at the um, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts for a wonderful ceremony. We met all the, the division or the region winners who were all extraordinary educators in their own right. And we got the announcement that in fact uh, Michelle had won the entire thing. It was a tremendous, wonderful evening, and I am now going to turn it over to Dr. Murphy for any ad additional comments. Um, and and yeah, absolutely. Congratulations uh, again, Michelle and Dr. Wilmore. Uh, we're very, very proud of you. So we have a special treat for you. We are going to roll the tape back, and we are going to see what exactly happened on Monday evening just prior to and during the announcement. So Jeremy, if you could uh, cue up the video, we'll watch it here on the screen behind us. Thank you. Just like the Oscars. <laughs> The 2018 Virginia Teacher of the Year from Region 4, Michelle Cottrell Williams, Arlington County Public Schools. The Virginia Department of Education presents the 2018 Virginia Teacher of the Year Award to Michelle Cottrell Williams. That's the part we had to fill in very late this afternoon. In recognition of your exemplary contributions to the teaching profession, and selection as the 2018 Virginia Teacher of the Year, September 18th, 2017. Michelle, congratulations. Very nicely done. I'm going to give you the mic and we'll get rid of all these other things. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you um, very much to the selection committee. Thank you to Lisa for um, nominating me. <laughs> Thank you to my family, um, to my principal, Dr. Wilmore, uh, my superintendent, Dr. Murphy, the school board, uh, everyone that has supported me and allowed me um, to become who I am uh, as a teacher. Um, and finally, to my students. Um, I couldn't have learned without them. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who said this. Uh, Albert Einstein is credited with the quote. Um, but everyone is born a genius. Uh, but if you ask a fish to climb a tree, he'll grow up his whole life believing that he's stupid. 
So to all of my fish out there, I'm going to keep finding you places to swim. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Any board colleagues, any company? We're all tearing up, I know. It's really emotional, isn't it? Really wonderful. Um, I, well, we, we have to take a photo, folks. Can we do that with our well, tears? I, I was wondering if we might give Michelle just uh, a oh, minute yes. or two to make a yes, few comments please. and share some thoughts. I know it's been a very busy uh, few days since Monday. practice my stump speech. <laughs> okay, of course, I also got emotional watching that, so bear with me here. Um, it's, uh, thank, thank you uh, for your support. Um, it's, uh, it's been inc an incredible week and an upcoming year, but the past 11 years as a teacher, um, the changes that I have experienced, the growth that I have gotten to um, go through uh, being with so many uh, students over the years has been uh, phenomenal. Um, I, I am really, really glad I got to be here on the same night uh, as the uh, Hispanic Latino leaders were recognized um, because that, uh, that was phenomenal to watch. Congratulations to those of you that are still here. Um, you have overcome so many challenges uh, to get where you are, to fit in uh, to a system that wasn't built for you. Uh, and that is, that is incredible, that's amazing. Um, and what's extra extraordinary is that now you are becoming leaders and you have the skills to fix things so that the next generation of Latinos coming here don't have to make the same hard choices that you did. You can make it better for them. Um, so that's an, an awesome um, power and opportunity that you have going forward. Um, so I want to say to you that I believe with all of my heart that immigrants make this country great and that you belong here. Uh, so thank you for all that you are. I can't wait to see what you do for our future. Thank you. And you heard her allude to it, but um, being Virginia Teacher of the Year does uh, entail some responsibilities to get out and, and do a lot of public speaking and inspiring of teachers all over the state. So um, she's really got an awesome responsibility and a great person to do it. So we're very, very proud. Yes. Um, I'd like to just let you know that we love people to stay and watch our school board meetings and we invite you all to, to consider doing so, but we understand that many people have busy lives and evenings. This is an easy point. If anyone would like to go ahead and leave after having been uh, celebrated, please feel, feel welcome to, to get up and, and depart at any time. It's, this is... This is the reality of our school board meetings. We know that not everyone wants to sit, sit with us all evening. We're, we're used to it. But if you want, you can watch us on TV <laughs> later and see yourselves and then listen to the school board meeting too. The, the video will In be the online. comfort yes. of your home. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. And you can always watch the video uh, tomorrow online. Yes. Over and over.
Thank you all so much for coming out. We are now at announcements. Upcoming back to school events include the Career Center Back to School Breakfast this Saturday at 9.30 a.m. at the Career Center, of course. High School Back to School Night is on Wednesday, September 27th. And Back to School Night for Middle Schools is on Thursday, September 28th. Also on Saturday, this Saturday, September 23rd, APS will host the Engage Saturday Open House at Kenmore Middle School, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And that will be to share our many initiatives. Um, and it's an open house. You please feel free to drop by if you're here in the audience. These flyers should be out in the hall where the agendas are. So please feel free to, to pick one up to remind you to, to attend. Uh, board members, do you have any announcements? Um, I just wanted to advise you all that I will be leaving early this evening uh, to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. My, well, I am Catholic, my husband is Jewish, and we celebrate both faiths in our home. And so we'll be celebrating that this evening. So I apologize for my early departure, but I did review the agenda and all the documents, and um, I am comfortable with the items on action, and I trust my school board colleagues to make great decisions on that. So again, I apologize for early departure, and for all of those of you who are celebrating, Shana Tova. Any other announcements? Ms. Van Dorn. I'd like to continue to hit the drumbeat of transportation and alternative choices of getting to school. Um, Next week, and I think Dr. Murphy is probably going to comment on this, is bike and walk to school day. Mm -hmm. So everybody who is uh, inclined, please do so. I'm going to get on my bike and bike, much probably to my daughter's chagrin. I'll do it with her. And uh, we will have fun getting into school. And I just wanted to encourage everybody to constantly be thinking about walking and biking as much as possible, driving as little as possible to drop off students, and uh, also, of course, taking the bus. So I want to encourage everybody to do that and let everybody know that we are working very hard in collaboration with the county on all of these different multimodal choices. And there's a citizens committee meeting on Monday evening at 7 uh, called the Arlington Committee on Transportation Choices, which is a joint school board, county board, uh, advisory committee to staff that has been really supportive and helping the staff move along in all the joint work that we need to do. And that's in the SIFAX room 103. Thank you. Any other announcements from the board? Dr. Murphy. All right, I've got some uh, duplications here, but I want to start out by saying thank you to all the staff and the families who came out last week for elementary school back to school night along with we had our back to school night for HB Woodlawn. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. Cannonin shared that we've got these back to school night events and breakfast coming up Saturday, which is a change. And I see uh, Ms. Chung was here as well as uh, uh, Dr. Thompson for the Career Center and Arlington Community High School. And then we've got our high school and middle school back to school nights respectively next week on September 27th and 28th. And it's, a, it's a great time for parents to come out and uh, have a chance to meet with their teachers and also meet with their administrators. And I do want to let folks know that I try and travel around to some of these and the ones that I can't get to. We have some of our um, executive leadership team members also uh, present at, so we look forward to seeing you out there at these activities. We've also mentioned coming up this Saturday, we have the um, engagement Saturday. We also have a number of staff that are coming out for this event. We've got our bilingual resource uh, folks coming out. We also have made connections with ambassadors uh, at all of the schools, and thanks that's to our school community as well as our schools for facilitating that. It's going to be from Saturday. It's going to start at 10 and go through 2. And what we encourage folks to do is to drop in uh, during that time period. We're going to be talking about all of the uh, main initiatives that uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit here with the superintendent update that we are focused on for the 2017-18 school year. But you can see some of the major processes that we're talking about there, boundary changes, the strategic plan. We're also soliciting folks to be a part of the strategic planning um, uh, steering committee. We're talking about some of the instructional uh, vision for the coming year, capital improvements, policy changes. And this is a way for uh, you to provide some feedback. Also, ask us some questions and learn about the timelines. Uh, and this will really help us move these processes along. I would say 
you could spend the whole four hours with us, or you could just drop in and maybe uh, decide which ones are of particular interest to you. It's going to be set up like a fair in the cafeteria so people can travel around, and we also have some breakout groups that we're going to be soliciting um, some small focus groups, some additional information. So if you're able to spend some more time with us, uh, we really encourage you to come by. Uh, maybe after you go to the Career Center and, and uh, uh, Community High School uh, breakfast. We are also going to be kicking off the middle school boundary adjustment process, and that begins on October the 2nd. I do want to <clears throat> point out to you, we've got a number of listening uh, sessions, but there are also duplications, uh, and they're in uh, different locations in the county. So the getting started sessions are Monday, October the 2nd, and Wednesday, October the 4th, respectively at Yorktown and Kenmore, and they run from 7 to 9. Uh, we also have a live streaming there. You'll make note for the Yorktown session. And then we'll come back with some of the things uh, that we've heard uh, and share that out. And again, those will be two sessions that we'll duplicate, one on October the 25th at Yorktown, the other on the 26th at Wakefield, and making note that we also will be live streaming uh, the one at Yorktown on the 25th. You can also see the timeline when I'll be coming forward with recommendations based on some of the feedback that we've learned. And then we've got a public hearing on the 30th with the school board slated to make a decision on December the 14th. Ms. Van Dorn mentioned also the, uh, the walk and bike to school date. Just want to make mention that should it rain, and we've been having some wonderful weather, we are scheduled for an October the 11th date, and uh, sort of echoing some of the comments that Ms. Van Dorn shared, sort of a healthy lifestyle, also the idea of multimodal, and this connects very nicely with some of our other programs, most significantly uh, the breakfast program. So encourage kids and families to come out on this day, uh, and it's a lot of fun. We're going to actually be, uh, each year we have different schools that we kind of identify as uh, you know, the, the centerpiece, and this year we're going to be at Hoffman Boston, which is going to be kind of the, the featured event. And we also have the county participating very actively in this. So this is a collaboration not only between Arlington Public Schools, but also the county. We have uh, the family resource, uh, resources on substance abuse. We are encouraging folks to come out to this town hall event that is going to be co-sponsored with APS along with county partners and the Commonwealth attorneys. And uh, as we know, drug abuse has become an increasing issue and concern, both nationally and locally. And we want uh, to join together to discuss how we can address this epidemic that is affecting our community. For those of you who also are um, interested in podcasts, and that's something I've recently uh, gotten into, I also want to encourage you to listen to one of our new podcasts called What's Up APS. The latest episode just released this week features a conversation with some of our counselors about signs and symptoms to look out for uh, regarding your child if substance abuse is a concern. So check out our website for more information about those podcasts and give us a little bit of feedback uh, and we can continue to strengthen those. As we know, uh, the weather has been influential in various parts of our country, especially with hurricanes, most notably that of Harvey and Irma. So our students here in Arlington have been very busy. It's really part of our strategic plan in meeting the needs of uh, all students, which includes teaching children that they have a power to make a difference in the lives of others throughout the world. So what we have been doing, McK uh, McKinley second graders collected school supplies and donated them to an independent uh, school in Clear Creek in Texas. Taylor held a fundraiser called Coins for Cause for Irma and Harvey Relief. Barrett raised over $1,000 through donations from students and staff called Hats for Houston. And Glebe has been raising money for the Red Cross, and the Glebe Girl Scouts are also collecting uh, goods for hurricane relief and partnering with AM Vets. Yorktown and Wakefield at one of their football games uh, collected school supplies, and Kenmore collected school supplies for Hopewell uh, Middle School in Victoria, Texas. So congratulations to all those students, and thank you for giving back. Uh, this year, we've also produced uh, a personalized handbook for families that addresses uh, some of the questions with our one-to-one -one initiative and digital citizenship. 
That booklet is being made available to families at some of the upcoming back to school nights. So our elementary families got those last week. Our middle school and high school families will be receiving them this week. And all students who are receiving a device for the first time also were provided access to bring this home and share with their families. There's some great tips in here uh, concerning um, you know, how we utilize technology uh, around screen time. Uh, that is not a substitute for going outside and playing. And really how to use the tool so it's an effective part of your learning. This information is also on the website. So when you head out to back to school night, I encourage you to look for this information as well. We've got then APS College and Career Night scheduled coming up for October the 17th. That's going to be right next door here at Washington Lee between 6 and 8 p.m. And we open this up to families of students from grades 5 through 12. And we've got over 140 colleges and universities coming out. Um, you know, different folks are at different places uh, along this continuum. Obviously, I know in talking to some of our 11th and 12th graders, uh, they are much more focused and have sort of narrowed the field to the schools that they see as a priority. And so their attendance at this may look a little bit different uh, than a 5th, a 6th, or 7th and 8th grader. But really, my encouragement is that families along that continuum come out, experience it, become familiar with it so as you transition and your child moves from middle school on to high school that they become familiar with what the fair looks like, what some of the options are, and they begin to learn about some of the um, different schools and opportunities that are out there. And we've got enthusiasm uh, from all of the colleges and universities that are participating and this is something that's sponsored by our student services office in collaboration with our Department of Instruction. So we look forward to seeing you out and hope that you can come out and enjoy it. That's all I've got right now, so thank you. Thank you very much. We are now ready to act on our consent agenda. Uh, may I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. I would like to announce as part of the consent agenda, the school board approved the lease with the children's school for the 2017-2018 school year. The children's school has agreed to remain at the Reed Building for the entire school year and will continue to partner with our integration station program there. We all appreciate the important relationship we have with the children's school and our APS program integration station. Discussions continue regarding how the future years will play out, especially given the school board's decision to return Reed back into an elementary school. Because the, discussion, because the discussions are contractual, we cannot discuss them at a public meeting. But please know that the school board is committed to keeping our integration station program strong and inclusive, and we support continued discussion with the children's school regarding next steps. We will now hear citizen comment on non-agenda items. Um, do we have speakers on non-agenda, Ms. Mercado? Yes, we have three speakers. Okay, I will therefore read the speaker guidelines first and we, then we will call them up. The school board welcomes public comment. Generally, school board members do not respond to comments during the meetings. If they've not already signed up online, speakers must submit a speaker slip to the clerk before the agenda item they wish to speak on is called. Each speaker may speak for up to two minutes. There's a timer to help you keep track of your time and speakers should conclude their remarks when the buzzer sounds. All comments should address a matter related to Arlington Public Schools. Speakers should be courteous and address their comments to the entire school board. Speakers are called in the order in which they sign up. If you have written comments, please give them to the clerk. And we do ask the audience to refrain from applauding. It takes away from the time of the next speaker. So please, if you want to express your um, enthusiasm, we like the silent knock, which is a nice visual cue for everyone in the room. Uh, Ms. Mercado? The first speaker is Mr. Uh, Jeff McCarthy. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Murphy. Uh, my name's Jeff McCarthy, and I'm an APS teacher. I'm also an Arlington resident, and I'm the father of two girls that have attended the children's school. For nearly 25 years, TCS and IS have worked cooperatively to create a program that's mutually beneficial to the young children in both programs. 
The TCSIS model is truly the gold standard when it comes to inclusion programs for very young learners. And it's a program that all of us are proud of. The degree of inclusion offered to integration station students couldn't be higher than uh, the program as it exists now. The program coexists with daycare classrooms of students of the same ages. There's also a degree of stability that exists in our program that can't be matched anywhere else. Many special needs students at this age may find themselves attending three different schools before the age of six. But integration station students are given the advantage of staying at our school for a number of years where they can form relationships with staff and with their peers in TCS. These relationships benefit IS students socially, emotionally, and developmentally. I'd also add that the TCS students greatly benefit from these relationships as well. There's a long list of things that APS does right, we know this, things that APS does better than other school districts. And the TCSIS relationship is one of those things. And now is the time for APS to reaffirm its commitment to this program. As our time in the Reed Building is nearing its conclusion, TCS has made plans for our future. June 30th is the last day in the Reed Building. And at the beginning of July, we're opening a new facility on North Fairfax Drive. The lease has been signed and the architects are at work on the designs. It's now time for APS to make its plans for the future of Integration Station. The necessity of specially built classrooms and facilities for IS staff and students necessitates that you make this decision soon. If you join us, you'll have preserved the successful inclusion program. If you don't, you'll then have to determine where to relocate IS and you'll have to determine when, where to relocate it at a time when we all know that there are a lot of issues related to insufficient space in the APS system. So I encourage you to join, uh, to join us at our new facility and preserve a program that serves as a model for successful inclusion of young learners. Keeping Integration Station and the Children's School under one roof is the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ms. Alisa Kisi. Good evening, thank you for having me here today. This is my first school board meeting in person. I have watched you on camera and on recording recorded sessions. Um, and I think today is particularly, particularly apropos for what I want to discuss given the promotion of bike and work to school day on October 4th. I've reached out to some of you in connection with an urgent matter involving our Thomas Jefferson student safety, which requires immediate attention. Thank you, Ms. Van Dorn and Mr. Goldstein for responding to me. Over the last few days, I've had an opportunity to observe the intersection of South 2nd Street and South Irving Streets as our kids make their way to TJ and battle the cross to cross the street safely against the morning commuting motorists, school buses, and other traffic. It's a disaster, a disaster that many of us predicted and raised during the BLPTC meetings and before a near tragedy where an Arlington County truck had to slam on its brakes to avoid hitting a student in the crosswalk yesterday morning told me I had to raise my concerns and do all that I can to get a response, emit to a response for immediate measures to improve student safety. I reached out to TJ, members of the school and county boards, AHCA, state delegates, and other governmental officials. We need your help, we've asked for it, and we need it now. Given the paramount importance of student safety and the critical need for safe routes to school, I was surprised to approach the same intersection this morning with no improvements. Nothing had changed. Again, this morning we had a near miss. I and other moms took it upon ourselves to serve as impromptu crossing guards. I've heard a lot, uh, in response to my um, issue that I've raised, I've heard a lot of siloed responses. We don't need siloed responses. We need everybody to work together to come to an immediate and helpful solution. Um, I'm, I'm Thank done. you. Sorry. Thank Thanks. you. The next speaker is Ms. Jennifer McIntyre. Good evening, Jenny McIntyre. 
Um, this is also my first school board meeting, as Dr. Murphy probably knows from our brief interaction. Um, I'm also here to speak about the Children's School Integration Station and their, the future of their partnership. I don't want to repeat, and I couldn't say it nearly as articulately as the first speaker did, about all the wonderful ways that that partnership benefits the children, all the children that are involved. But I want to offer a personal testimonial as a parent of a child in the special ed side of things on the integration station, and to urge you to make the decisions and make the investments that will be needed. And I do recognize that it will require investments to allow those programs to stay together because they've been so fruitful for so many children and families and, and will be in the future as well. My daughter Annie has Down syndrome, has been a special ed student in APS since she was two years old. She's now in her third year at the integration station where she's made unbelievable progress in her development, her language, and her readiness for kindergarten. And much of this progress we credit to her opportunity to learn every day alongside her typically developing peers with whom she's formed bonds since she was two years old. And so in my view, the question whether we're going to abandon this relationship or continue it at some cost is kind of a question of the direction we want to move in inclusion. Um, are we going to move backwards and limit opportunities, or are we going to um, preserve and create more, more and as was mentioned, the uniqueness of this partnership is that it allows the continuity from age two to five, same peers, same families, same teachers, same setting, so the kids aren't bouncing around, uh, which can be very disruptive to any child, but especially children with special needs. Um, and that is exactly the scenario that our child would have faced but for the integration station's partnership. And I would also point out that if this partnership goes away, the alternatives for inclusion are not going to adequately meet every child's needs. The Montessori model um, isn't, isn't ideal for children like mine who learn best by following along with a group. The Montessori is more individual and independent, um, which is not ideal for um, a child like mine to develop those language exchanges and social interactions. So I urge you to please do what needs to be done to keep that partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, two monitoring items tonight. The first is the superintendent's update on the 2017-2018 action plan. Dr. Murphy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cannon. So this evening, um, I'd like to share with you where we are with the 2017-18 uh, action plan, and I'm going to do a little bit of uh, a walk through history here. Uh, you may have recalled last year we developed the three to five year action plan, which is represented here on this slide, as far as the many initiatives and pro projects that we have over the next uh, three to five years uh, starting last year. So we laid those out um, in accordance with our strategic plan that is currently designed. And then this year, what we have transitioned to is many of the topics that I'm going to mention along with Lisa Stingle as far as where we are at this point in the year and those projects and initiatives that we're going to be continue to address. As we um, look at these, though, they're prioritized um, in the respect to providing the best learning experience for, for students with our decision making also recognizing that we continue to experience enrollment growth and shifting demographics along with the state educational requirements changing and evolving and recognize also that many of these projects and initiatives are extremely complex and overlapping initiatives over a period of time uh, and so i think it's important for us to kind of keep that in front of us as we look at many of the projects that we have slated for this year and how they dovetail together you can see here that we've identified each of those, but we've placed them into four buckets. First, new policies and policy revisions, and you can see the ones that fall out in that category. We've also got operational plans, most significantly the strategic plan where we are soliciting uh, individuals to be part of that steering committee. But then many of the annual or um, activities that occur every other year along with the budget, and the capital improvement plan. We are preparing for new schools program moves for 2019. And by doing that, and this is the complexity and overlapping piece, we are addressing middle school and elementary boundaries as well as the move of the Montessori program and the opening of the, the new Drew model school. And then finally, there are several capital initiatives that we have decisions around that include the Career Center, uh, the Educational Center, and the Reed Building. Last year, uh, thanks to the work of uh, community service, 
uh, and relations, we developed uh, the APS Engage web page. And I want to point folks there because as we update a lot of the information or ask for feedback or solicit input, this is a good place for you to go to find out about the various updates and happenings and calendars and events. And so it's very sequentially laid out. It's got a series of pull-down menus, and it really can kind of inform you with what's happening. Uh, there are essentially one-pagers here that give folks a little bit of an overview of what's happening. And so you can very quickly learn some information about each of those different projects and initiatives. I'm going to turn at this point to Lisa Stingle, who's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, Engage with APS and some of the new approaches that we're taking to get participation and feedback from folks. And then we're going to w walk through some of the things that are slated here uh, throughout the fall and tell you specifically about some of those uh, dates and activities that we have planned. So, Ms. Stingle. Good evening. Um, so let me start off by saying some of the things that Dr. Murphy mentioned aren't on the website quite yet. They're coming soon and um, we should be up there on Monday. So we've taken a new approach with each of these projects. Um, what we found as we were talking to families last year and we sort of jumped into the work was that we needed to provide more information. We needed to provide it earlier and we needed to help them get into the process. So with each of these projects, approximately two weeks ahead of starting the community engagement process, we're putting out information on what we're doing and why. You know, really the background information so they understand what's happening. Um, we're telling them who's impacted, which students or, or schools or neighborhoods, and when it will take place. We're telling them how they can participate, you know, both in person and online, and then how we're going to use their feedback. We, we learned last year that this is an area where we really need to be clear. Sometimes um, when we ask people to come out, they think they're actually making the decisions when at the end of the day it's the school board making the decisions. They're providing feedback that we're actually putting in our recommendations. We're making sure that we outline the schedule of engagement activities and um, the school board actions and communicating via multiple methods. So we're putting these out through lots of different places. Um, and then during the engagement period, we have different ways for people to participate. They can come in person to events at those events, usually the first night, if, depending on which ones, we're streaming those and then we're able to post them online. We're doing it in, in um, Spanish also so that they can either listen and they can participate in Spanish at the meeting or they can hear it online in Spanish. Um, and we're also creating similar things so people who don't have the, the time to watch can actually still weigh in on the issues online. And then we have our ambassadors and liaisons that I'll talk about in a minute who are helping us get those messages to families at schools. Um, again, Dr. Murphy mentioned earlier tonight about the kickoff, the engagement day that we're having on Saturday at Kenmore Middle School. And really this is a chance for people to come out and hear about those, piece, those um, projects that we're working on this year. We don't have all the information, but when they stop by, they'll be able to again learn about some of the bigger pieces. When do we plan on doing it? What are the big, what, what are we trying to do? And the same messages that I just talked about. We'll also be gathering their feedback and we'll be using what they, they ask us as part of our development of frequently asked questions and what we need to sort of message when we roll these things out. We'll be giving them the timeline and um, We'll be asking for their feedback. We're also going to have a little kickoff activity. We're piloting how we're going to ask them about what they want to see in the strategic plan. And then we'll roll this out with all our advisory committees next month and different groups. So we've taken a different approach with how we are coordinating. You know, we get a lot of messages out centrally, but families don't always hear them. And so we've been working with our principals and they've helped us identify ambassadors in their schools. And what the goal is to help all families hear about these things. They may choose not to participate, but we want to make sure that we're getting at them from multiple ways. So we have parent ambassadors at each school. Sometimes there's multiple, you know, and we're making sure that they're keeping that connection going. We have monthly updates that are going to also um, through the schools and department staff. The principals are getting this information to share with their staff. We know that sometimes families talk to teachers and teachers, if they can point them to the Engage website, they don't have to know everything, but if they can help parents, families navigate that's helpful to us. Um, our PR and web liaisons are also helping and then the bilingual resource assistants are also sharing that information. So the policies that we're working on this year, the options and transfers follow up, we talked about this already and I think this is moving under the strategic plan so I should have checked that box there. Um, that group will actually look at what our options, defining what our, our, our goals for options are. 
acceptable use policy we'll hear about I think at the next school board meeting and the plan for the inclusion policy work which is how we include special ed students and make sure they get the access to to the the most um, appropriate educational classroom they can again that policy that process will go on um, I think in January that begins and we recently added the school facility and naming policy that doc, uh, that Ms. Erdos will talk about later tonight Group two was the prep for new schools and program moves, and we are going to be talking about elementary school boundaries in January, the Montessori move, more details will come out less, next month, and middle school boundaries. Dr. Murphy talked a little bit about this, so we are getting ready to make changes to middle school boundaries. We've got a new school opening in 2019, so we need to establish boundaries for them. It'll provide some relief to some of our middle schools that are currently um, above capacity and um, it'll balance enrollment across the schools. The new boundaries will apply in 2019-20 and impact students who are currently in fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and then the students who follow behind them. So there's sort of three phases of this. Right now you can learn about the process. There's information on the Engage webpage about this with, a lot of, with details sort of how to get involved, why we're doing it. The getting started meetings are in early October. And again, we'll be posting those streamed versions online. They'll all be um, also done in Spanish. And then we'll have another series of community, community meetings, what we heard. So at the first meeting, we plan to gather feedback on some proposals. Staff will work on that feedback and incorporate it and come back at the what we heard meetings and talk about, give some changes and get more feedback. Um, and that feedback will shape the superintendent's recommendations to the board. And the timeline for your decisions begin in November, and we wrap up on the 14th of December. So there's opportunities, again, for the community to come out if they have concerns with the recommendations. Operational planning is ongoing, so the FY19 budget process is very similar to previous years. We'll be coming back to you with uh, an update on the FSAP and the CIP framework in the next uh, month. And the capital improvement plan begins after that. It's a follow-on that plans for what do we need for facilities going forward in the next 10 years. And then we start with, the, we talk about the strategic plan. We'll kick that off next week, but I just wanted to um, let you know that this week we put out four different, communica we communicated with four different groups. So we sent an all staff message to get um, staff to participate in the strategic planning process. We reached out to the community partners that, um, School and Community Relations has been engaging with that group and, and collect, getting the communication going with them. So we've asked them um, for representation. We've, again, sent it out to families again, and it will go out through the ambassadors again tomorrow. And each time we put that out, we see little bumps and more people um, who are willing to serve as volunteers. That window is open until Monday, and we, we're really looking for um, a good representative group of the community. Our capital initiatives are the Reed Building, and you'll hear about that tonight, the Career Center and the Education Center. Um, the Career Center, the school board's June 29 motion voted to have 700 to 800 high school seats at the Career Center, and that motion begins to define a charge for the working group. So JFAC is going to be actually just studying how the, the process was next week. And then there'll be a, a joint meeting between JFAC and um, FAC on the 11th of October um, to look at the, the charge for the working group. There is an information item on October 19th and an action on November 2nd. And then the Education Center, again, that same motion had a motion for 500 to 600 high school seats here at the Education Center, and it defines a charge for the working group. So the phase one of this process is to figure out what instructional program will be at this, at this school. Um, and so that begins in October. We're still looking for a date. We've got so many community engagement um, things on the calendar right now. We're looking for a date that works both for the neighborhood and for staff to um, do something here at the site that's going to be impacted. So either at the Ed Center or Washington Lee. So by next, early next week, we should have a date on that. But it'll, we'll give a two-week buffer so that people have a chance to know when it's going to happen. Um, staff is right now working on proposals. One of the proposals will be to increase Washington Lee, which would allow us to have 600 students. And what would that look like? Would it be increasing IB and maybe some other things with it? The other proposal or proposals, one or two, will actually focus on small instructional programs. So maybe, you know, something else that would be in here. That, and those were some of the things that were proposed by the ACI group last year. Those will be what the community will, will be weighing in on and giving us feedback on for preferences. 
And then once that work is done, the, that decision will come back to you. And phase two is when the BLPC, the Building Level Planning Committee, plans for the renovations of the site. Um, we're looking for a date. We don't have a date for that community meeting, but you can um, see some of this information is probably not quite up yet. It will be up tomorrow. Um, and the community feedback, again, is going to shape the superintendent's recommendations on what that instructional program is going to be. Your action is scheduled for November 2 and the 14th, and then you'll see the BLPC um, recommendations come back again in the spring. So I'll just end again with that. We hope people come out on Saturday and learn more about what's going on and help us keep the community engaged in those processes that impact them. Thank you very much. Ms. Mercado, any speakers? No speakers. No speakers. Okay, let's see if there are questions or comments, board colleagues. And I know, um, Ms. Talento, you're going to have to leave probably sometime soon just to remind everyone. Um, so, uh, Mr. Goldstein? Um, actually, just one, and it's on the, um, the last uh, piece of this, um, our agenda. Uh, where we had the speakers on the, um, the non-agenda items. And now that we know about the, um, the future of the children's school, uh, could we possibly get a, um, a follow-up on an analysis of what it would take for us to co-locate the um, uh, integration station with that uh, children's school in the new location? Uh, that actually is something that staff has been working on for some time, so we've been working very closely with uh, the administration at the children's school as well as at integration station. So that's something that's already in motion. We'd be happy to provide the board with an update as far as what some of the pre-planning for that looks like. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Lento? I just wanted to um, ask, will there be availability to apply for the strategic planning committee at, in, at the open house? Okay. Yes. I, I just wanted to confirm that because I've been want, sharing that with some community members, so I just wanted to make sure. Are you doing the text groups as well? Don't know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. Okay. And no questions over here, right? All good. Um, and I just have one question, and it's about your Group Three slide on the AFSAP update. And the question is, um, you know, we've when we did the option policy last spring. We were kind of referring to a fall update, which sort of is your recommendations about potential transfers or other things to kind of address uh, acute capacity issues, you know, in the short term. And that, we didn't use that term in here. I just want to clarify whether that fall update concept is in here. So that's part of what, what's going on is we, you know, you, you originally would have gotten the AFSEP over the summer but we wanted to make sure we included the decisions on the high school, the 1,300 seats, along with the um, options and transfers pieces in there. So what we're trying to do is make sure you have both short-term decision points that apply for the next year or two, which include the options and transfer policy, as well as those longer-term ones that begin to shape that CIP framework. So you'll get both in there. Okay. To clarify, you do expect, to, do you expect to have some recommendations about maybe some some new neighborhood to neighborhood type transfers we could offer to people in the more crowded schools. Yeah, and the big piece is we're waiting for the September 30 membership report. Yes. We, okay. You know, we want to make sure that um, the numbers that are coming in this year, uh, if they work for that. Okay, I yep. just wanted to confirm that we still have that yep. in our plan. Good, yep. excellent. All right, I think there are no more questions or comments. Thank you very much. Oh, absolutely, yes. Ms. Van Doren. I'm sorry. During announcements, I should have acknowledged uh, the GW graduate school class that is filling the last three rows of our, <laughs> of our uh, audience. Thank you for being here. I understand that this is part of your class, and you are in, in an educational leadership class and observing a board meeting. I've had the pleasure of speak, coming to um, uh, Dr. Caval's class and speaking, and would be more than happy to do that with any of you anytime. Thank you. I hope this is all making some sense to you. But this is democracy at work and uh, <laughs> how, an, how a growing school system runs through its paces to get everything done. So thank you very much for coming and thank for your patience. And thank you to Dr. Caval for bringing your class here with us tonight. Yes. Thank you so much for coming. I was wondering which topic we had coming up. Where, uh, there were going to be a lot of speakers. <laughs> I was like, wow, they're waiting for something. I wonder what's... 
So uh, yeah, welcome, we're really happy to have you and, and thank you for your interest in school board policy. Uh, we are gonna move on to our next item, which is an update on the Arlington Tech Program and career and technical and adult education. Dr. Murphy or Dr. Natris. Good evening. Um, so we are here this evening to share an update um, very much focused on the work that's happening at Arlington Tech. We are in our second year of the program and are planning to highlight a lot of the work that is happening there. And as you can see, we had a team just move up. We have students here to share some of the work this evening, as well as Chris Martini, our Director of Career Technical and Adult Education. So I'm actually gonna turn things over to Margaret Chung, the principal of the Career Center, and she is going to highlight a lot of work and also provide updates on Arlington Tech. Good evening, school board members, school board chair, Dr. Cannonan, Dr. Murphy, and members of our ELT. I am very excited to share with you our updates for Arlington Tech. Um, it's been an exciting year. We have um, quite a few students that have joined our, our new program. It is a wonderful place to be. Our new students and returning students have added an incredible sense of energy and can-do spirit that has really transformed uh, the Career Center. As you can see, this is our, our group. And we have 91 ninth graders and 40 10th graders at Arlington Tech. And pictured here in our newly refurbished activities room, which used to be the back of our carpentry area. So facilities has been very busy updating our place and being able to meet the growing needs of our program. We have, um, actually, we have two of our students here tonight, and I'm gonna start with them because I think they really speak volumes about our programs. We have. Abby and Tarek, so I'm gonna have them come up and speak. Um, thank you to school board members, Dr. Murphy, and school board chair, Dr. Cannonan, for this opportunity to talk about our program. We, we are, are Arlington, Arlington Tech, Tech at the Arlington, Arlington Career Center. Center. Um, my name is Abby, I'm a ninth grader at Arlington Tech. I'm a born and bred military kid. I've been to eight schools in nine years and I've had my share of good teachers and the not so good. I've even had the chance of teaching myself through homeschool, so I know who I am as a student. I love being able to apply what I've learned, being able to understand a sense of French in the subway or hold my own in a conversation about geography is thrilling to me. When I first heard about Arlington Tech and project-based learning, I got really excited about the opportunity to have a high school experience where learning felt meaningful and relevant. I dragged my parents to all the meetings, I enrolled and quickly got to work on the summer projects, and I probably overdid it a little bit. The school year has just started, but even so, I've used what I'm learning in my computer science course to program an animation-like video for science class. I'm super excited for the opportunity to try a lot of different things here. My dad, seeing my excitement, has decided to geobatch for the next few years so I can go here. Knowing that, I'm determined to work hard and leave as a leader and innovator in the workforce. Uh, hi, I'm Tarek. I'm a 10th grader at Arlington Tech. Even though it's only been three weeks since the school year started, we've already done some pretty interesting projects. Uh, in my English class, we're doing something called Genius Hour, where every Friday we get the entire period to work on any project we want, as long as it integrates uh, content from a variety of our classes. My group decided to do something for animal science, so we went down to that class and asked if there was anything they needed, and they had just gotten a baby Great Dane puppy. so. We decided to make a little food and water, an elevated food and water holder for it, as well as a little towel rack. Now, what we could have done, so it can, it can wipe this little face. Yeah. Um, it, uh, so what we could have done is just made a little table and called it a day. But the cool thing about Genius Hour is we get to define what done means. So we decided to incorporate uh, wood, metal, and 3D printing. We have a really nice 3D printer that can 3D print in like Kevlar, carbon fiber, nylon, I mean, anything. Um, 
So we decided to integrate all that and design something that we could really be proud of and just do as much as we could with the time that we had. In, uh, we also built an aquaponics system for our environmental science class in, in collaboration with our culinary arts and sustainable technology programs. In engineering, we also designed, modeled, and 3D printed custom access card cases for the teachers and faculty because the holes punched on the individual cards like broke off often. So, um, so we did all this in the first few weeks. I'm pretty excited to see what we can do next. Pretty amazing. <laughs> um, as you can see, um, our interpretation of project-based learning is that it's authentic and client-based. And we're so proud of our students. They really are our strongest ambassadors. They will actually be attending eighth grade assemblies next week and talking directly to the eighth graders. So Abby, for example, will be going to Gunston on Monday. Yep. And she'll be talking directly to the students about her experience. Uh, after that, we will have tours, which our students will lead, um, of our program. So we will invite um, the upcoming ninth graders, current eighth graders, to come and tour the school. And our students will lead the tours. And then in December, we'll actually have some lunch and learns, and we'll be taking our students, and they'll be able to talk with eighth grade students in small groups and coaching them and giving them direct answers to their questions. So as you can see, our, our students are our best marketers of the program because they speak directly from experience. And here we have our projected growth uh, and enrollment for Arlington Tech. Um, I do have to adjust the number for this year. We are at 131, but still growing. We continue to accept students as they move into this area. Um, and we are projected to uh, grow by 200 new students next year and so on to 800 by the year 2021. Now I'd like to introduce Katherine Steinmetz, and she's our coordinator of Arlington Tech, and she'll speak about our program highlights. Good evening. When you think about Arlington Tech, what really distinguishes Arlington Tech are these, these things. Um, and it's the experience, the learning experience, and that's really what our students spoke about. That's what got Abby excited to come to Arlington Tech. And, and, and students, as they visualize what they want from their high school career, if that fits with the model that, that we're out there telling people about, it's these things. And, and it starts with project-based learning. And project-based learning is inquiry-based, so students learn through discovery. And it's self-directed, so students have the opportunity to be creative in how they want to master content and how they want to develop skills. For instance, another project these students didn't speak about um, was a project our biology teacher did last year. Um, she asked students to design a super crop. And the students hadn't yet learned genetics. And so they, in doing this project, the first thing they had to do is identify, well, what do I need to know in order to design this super crop? And they started to come up with lists that quite you know, um, not surprisingly, were aligned with the, the standards of learning for biology in terms in, in, in the genetics category. So they started to identify, well, I need to know these things. And then our teacher was there to give them resources, to give them lessons, to find ways for them to learn those things. And they were doing this in the context of the project. And when we say it's relevant and meaningful, it's they were learning it so they could do this task, so they could build this super crop. It also integrated social studies because they were thinking about um, global food shortages and, and, and uh, climate change and weather. They were also thinking about engineering and design uh, strategies. Um, and so our projects are interdisciplinary and in that way our students get excited about the things that they can incorporate into the project. And they're quite honestly, they're the ones finding those connections more often than our teachers are. Um, our, our students will walk through um, go through the high school in a cohort. Um, so our 10th grade cohort is at 40, our 9th grade is at 91, but they'll have a structured course pathway. They're taking the same classes at the same time, um, with the exception of their CTE elective. That they choose based on their interest and their career goal. Um, but their academic classes are the same, and that gives our students the ability to do projects 
um, using the content that they're all getting at the same time. Those benchmarks, they're hitting at the same time. It also allows our teachers to plan inter interdisciplinary projects because our English teacher knows that our ninth graders are hitting a, a, a unit um, on World War II at the same time she can plan something relevant in her class. Um, the biggest thing and, and is our um, access to CTE core ECT classes, and that's core to our academics. Our students are finding ways, and our teachers are finding ways to take what they're learning in their academic classes and apply it in their CTE courses, and vice versa. They can't do projects with just content. They need the skills, they need the technology that they're getting in their CTE course, courses. Um, the other thing that really distinguishes our program, and it's the, and speaks to the rigor is the opportunity for dual enrollment. By the 11th grade, all of our students will be in uh, dual enrolled classes. Um, all of their core academic classes will be dual enrolled. Um, so English will be a composition class um, that's um, dual enrolled with NOVA. Math, science, um, and even some of our CTE options as well. Um, and then the last thing is in their senior year, our students will have an ex opportunity to participate in a capstone experience that will extend throughout the whole year, and that would be based on the student's interest. They could do a re something that's a research project that would be mentored from, that they'll connect with a mentor on, or an internship, a job placement. Last year, and not only in starting the year, we found some incredible partners. Um, when we talk about client-driven projects, we want that to be not just fictional, but real. We want our students to work with members of our community uh, and develop things, pro develop products um, that they can share. So some of the coolest projects we did last year is um, we, we did a project with NASA where our students um, produced short videos, science for students, spy students, that targeted common misconceptions. So they had to learn the science behind what these misconceptions were. They also had to learn how to produce a video, write a script. They also had to learn how to communicate with professionals because we were, um, it was an incredible opportunity. Our students were working hand in hand with scientists, engineers, and producers at Goddard throughout the whole set process. They had to pitch storylines. They had to get scripts to prove. They had to, to um, present on the science. Uh, and, in the, at, at, and then finally, they went to Goddard to show their final product. So it was an incredible opportunity. The Go Baby Go um, partnership we have with Marymount University, our engineering and our collision repair students um, retrofitted uh, toy cars to be adaptive for students with disabilities, not students, um, small children, preschoolers with disabilities. And so they had to learn, um, the, the child was the client, they had to learn what the need of the, the client was, how could they create an engineering solution for that child. They also worked with the physical therapy students at Marymount University to, to understand how this car could be therapeutic for the child as well. Um, and we have some incredible projects. Many of these partners we're continuing with and we're expanding on that project this year and we're, we've brought in some new partners as well. Thank you, Catherine. Ah, the profile of a Virginia graduate. Well, I believe Arlington Tech is the perfect fit. We indeed um, provide students with workplace skills. Um, and as you've heard, we engage the community and provide opportunities for civic responsibility. And there's plenty of opportunities through all 24 of our CTE courses that we offer for career exploration. Content is simply a way to apply what they've learned through these real life and work-based experiences. We are the intersection of all four of these circles and our students are the profile of a Virginia graduate. Thank you very much, and if you have any questions. Okay, um, anyone, questions, comments? Mr. Lander. Thank you all for your presentation. Uh, Dr. Natchez, I have a quick question for you. Uh, with regard to um, creating these opportunities as the awareness of these uh, project-based learning opportunities for our students. 
at the high school level, I think that the students are great ambassadors. We have, at some point down the road, a couple years, we'll have a middle school opening up. Is there an opportunity to um, integrate project-based project learning at the middle school level, uh, potentially at a new uh, middle school that we have open up? Um, so a couple of things. One, through the strategic planning process, we are going to be looking at our K-12 instructional vision, which includes what are the kinds of things we want all students to experience and what are the kinds of things that fit with individual schools or programs. So we're going to have to distinguish that um, as part of the strategic planning process and thinking about what does the community believe about those things. Um, as we're doing our curriculum writing work as a system, we are also working to build in performance tasks and project-based learning into specific units so that all students experience it. And then we'll have to make the decision as a community as to do we do it at this level across the board as much as possible or do we do it within individual programs. So a lot of that will come with the strategic plan. Right, the challenge is <coughs> the program is growing in parallel to the strategic plan. So I'm not sure the community is, has been educated enough or we have, uh, provided enough awareness and information about the opportunities and the advantages or disadvantages or just um, giving parents an opportunity to think about it as we move forward. So um, as we transition into the strategic plan part, um, is there something that we can do either through communications, uh, through information and awareness ahead of the strategic plan to help answer some of the questions and help the community um, uh, have a, a, a broader perspective on the program so that we don't miss our opportunity if it's indeed, I mean, because we won't do our, another strategic plan for seven years and the program will already hopefully be at 800 students. So, I mean, we, we won't get another shot at this middle school um, opening up. And so that's why I think it's, you know, if we can do something as a board, as a community, to sort of push the information out. I know uh, Ms. Chung is, is a great ambassador, but she can't be all places all the time. And so having the students at Gunston, at uh, uh, Swanson, Williamsburg, Kenmore, and Jefferson, I had to make sure I remembered them all, um, and H.P. Woodlawn. I mean, this is an opportunity for those students also to um, learn about the program and, and see if that's an opportunity that they may want to engage. So I don't know how we do, I don't want to wait until a strategic plan before we start to have that conversation. Yeah. So on a more micro level, we've started to do a lot of that work both internally and externally. So even over the last couple of weeks, really supporting our um, middle school directors of counseling and the counselors at all of the middle schools to really be able to articulate this program. We're going to be working with our bilingual um, resource assistants and several other groups to then go out and communicate with the community around Arlington Tech specifically, as well as with some of the other pieces. So that's just a great idea. Do, have our counselors taken a tour of the program? They, so we actually, was that Monday? What day was that? I don't even know what today is. It was last Friday. Um, so last Friday we had um, all of the directors of counseling at the Career Center. They did a tour of the program. They met with students and were able to have conversations with them. They met with Catherine. And between now and the beginning of December, all of our counselors will have had a tour and gone to visit the program. So and achievement they coordinators? Yeah, we're working on all of the main groups who need to be there, yes. Please don't forget those. We will not forget. Ms. Mr. Goldstein. Um, thank you. Uh, so the source of my questions uh, is that I talk to community members all the time, and I'm talking up Arlington Tech, and there are a lot of community members more and more all the time who have heard of it and many are you know even you know leaning towards it possibly considering it for their current middle school students but there are not a lot of them who have a lot of good information about it and they keep asking um, you know detailed questions so I want to be able to you know put a lot of meat on the bones and be able to point them to this session and you know other information that we put out um, so that'll, you know, over time help to answer questions that they've got. So um, can you go to the, I don't know what slide it is. It's the one titled Moving Forward. 
Yeah. There we go. And can you update the actual enrollment numbers mm -hmm. on there? Yes. Yeah, so we have 91 ninth graders and we have 40 tenth graders. So it's 131 for 2017-18. So we're nine students under the projection. Um, and are they, did all of the ninth graders last year become tenth graders? Um, so we had through natural attrition as families move and other things, um, we did have a few students moving from ninth to tenth grade who were no longer able to continue in the program. So we added some um, tenth graders to keep that number at 40 this past year. So that is, is that our is that policy or practice? But we are doing that. We are, we are allowing that. students to join Arlington Tech at the 10th grade level, even though they haven't been ninth graders there. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, we've got a very aggressive um, projection for Arlington Tech in the next few years. So what's the plan for attracting double the amount of ninth graders next year that we were looking for this year. So we've talked about a few of those things this evening. One is the work that we're doing directly with our middle school um, directors of counseling, our counselors, our minority achievement coordinators, our bilingual resource assistants. So really working with the middle schools um, to be ambassadors for this program. And Catherine can speak more directly to some of the specifics of that. Um, but it includes the middle school students going to Arlington Tech for tours. It includes the students from Arlington Tech going to the middle schools and actually the middle schools they attended so that students will know them. So we're trying to have former Gunston students go to Gunston, former Jefferson students go to Jefferson and talk with the other students about the program. Um, last year we did some things where they actually engaged in project-based learning activities at the middle school so they could get a feel for what the program was like. Um, so we're doing things like that so they can experience at their school and also see it um, at the school so that they can consider whether or not that's the appropriate fit for them. Um, we're doing things like being out at community events. We were out at the Knock um, Community and Pride Day last weekend sharing information about Arlington Tech. So we're also trying to be out um, in the community really sharing a lot of the work that's happening. And our middle school principals we met with today to really share that this is incredibly important work for the system as a whole and we really need everyone to fully understand the program and so we're also trying to take these ideas and get them out there in ways that um, really connect with people. So when we talk about project-based learning, what really does that look like? And I know the team's been working on some student videos and other things that we can have posted because it is something that when you don't hear directly from students or see it in action, it can sometimes be challenging to describe. So we're working with our school and community relations team to take these elements and put them into flyers and put them into various documents in addition to all of that face-to-face -face, um, work. So we really have a lot of targeted plans to speak about the program with different groups. And that's double the effort that we were doing last year because we're looking for double the, the enrollment. I, I Next year. think so, and I think having additional students in the program, right? So now we have another 131 ambassadors, whereas last year we had 40. So I think those efforts will continue to evolve um, and replicate themselves as we move forward. Okay, good. Um, of course, we're going to need seats for them. So are the expansion plans that we have in line with the enrollment growth that we've got planned? So they are. We've always had, even within the conversation around what we'll be doing with the Career Center overall, those 800 seats for Arlington Tech are accounted for in those plans, yes. It, it, but that's going to take some build-out. I mean, the, the build-out will... We have the will, phases will that are part come of online the Come online apace with the, with the enrollment. Yes. Mr. Chadwick. Yeah, if I may. Um, Please. In the uh, last CIP, you actually approved... Um, $12 million project to bring the seats at Arlington Tech up to 600 by the summer of 18 because of the other plans um, that are underway for the Career Center to which they, which they need to be integrated with. And we'll be doing some more renovations next summer to find more space for those 200 students pending a larger um, project as we proceed through um, phase the remainder of phase one and phase two of the Career Center, which of course is now the seven to 
800, seven to 800 seats that were approved uh, by you in June, which is phase two. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, can you go to the next slide? I think it is program program highlights. Yeah. Um, so um, help me understand in the second bullet. What's a, what's structured course pathway? So the students are traveling together in a cohort model and following specific courses with the exception of their CTE electives. Their CTE electives they are choosing, but otherwise students are traveling between courses together as a group to allow for a lot of the cross-disciplinary project-based learning. Okay. Um, and I think we talked about, you talked about in the presentation, um, the, the next bullet, the core CTE core to academics, the client-driven projects. Mm -hmm. um, and the next one, dual enrollment, uh, I think I heard that by 11th grade, all of the students would be in dual enrolled courses. And so that's 30 to 40 college credits, which is what, 10 to 13 college courses. So they will be enrolled for all of their core academic courses, and then they may have some dual enrollment for their CTE courses, depending on what it is they select. So after their senior year, they can graduate with 30 to 40 college credits through the dual enrollment process. And which college is it that's going to grant those credits? Um, so NOVA and any? NOVA. So it's NOVA. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And, and that's all lined up, right? I mean... Mm -hmm. Nova's already given approval for this. Okay, great. Um, okay, and the last bullet, the capstone. Mm -hmm. And can you give me an example or some examples of research projects? I mean, I think I understand what internships are, but what research projects would be qualifying as capstone projects? Do you want to take that one? I mean, I can Do give you examples of what I have, but they've been planning it, and I don't want to misspeak, so. So students either are interested in, in kind of an R&D approach to what they're studying in CTE or the more practical internship. If they choose to do research, we are, we are actually reaching out to Virginia Tech, um, Marymount University, and we're hoping to recruit graduate students that would then um, mentor and work with our Arlington Tech students based on their interests. So for instance, Abby is taking the cybersecurity course right now, and we have a, an incredible partnership with Marymount University. Our instructor is actually a PhD candidate there, and so we're hoping to recruit some graduate students that would then work with Abby, and she could actually do actual, almost graduate level work, research that graduate level students are, are doing. Okay, great. Um, and that would take place during the senior year, right? Yes. <clears throat> so students, for the most part, in the morning would be able to meet all the graduation required coursework. And then in the afternoon, they would have the opportunity to do the research um, with the universities or experience a workplace internship. And are you anticipating um, planning and organizing that you know, during the 11th grade year, the way Wakefield that, does with their senior project? That is correct. Okay. Um, good. Thank you. Can you go to the, maybe it's the last one. Yeah, I think we heard about that one. And um, so I see how the top three, you know, fit into what you've described. But how do you, how do we describe the fit for um, community engagement and civic responsibility? <laughs> Almost all their projects involve community engagement, so I see. <laughs> yes, it's it. I see. All, all these projects uh, okay. were actually client-based and involved the community. Yep. I see. Absolutely. So I think. Uh, okay, I've not made that connection before. Can I? Sorry. Can I? I think it. 
I think the Phoenix Bikes project that we're expanding on would be a great example of that. Last year we did really the traditional Phoenix Bikes program, which is where they build a bike and then they earn a bike. Um, and, and for many of our students, they decided to donate that bike to the community. Well, this year um, we've adapted that and we've included new partners in that program. And our students are going to still build bikes and rehab bikes, but we're going to do it in a way that we're building a library of bikes at the Career Center, so a bike share, a Career Center bike share. And so we're engaging not only Phoenix Bikes, but again, some of our other CT programs. So our collision repair students are going to paint them all purple. Our um, computer science students are going to create the program, the coding for the check-in, check-out. And then our engineering students are going to actually um, build the mechanism or the bike rack that will unlock and lock these bikes. And then our students who have diverse backgrounds at, the, at, our, at our school will have the opportunity to take bikes maybe to Washington Lee for an after school activity. They can check that bike out. They can take it to an after school job. They can take it home if they want. Um, but that would be one way for us to kind of engage in um, providing transportation for our community. Okay, thanks. Last question. Do you have any plans for making these courses available for our adult ed program? Because I'd like to take them. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. We can explore that with Mr. Bartini, and then you can sign up. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yes, right. is, is the answer. We have some already there, not, not all the mm -hmm. Make sure he gets a catalog. All right. <laughs> Ms. Van Dorn. Oh, so much to comment on. Mr. Goldstein, I am a proud graduate of Career Center Adult Education courses and have taken framing, electrical, carpentry, and plumbing. All right, so there's more to take now, and I will come and do it with you. I love that stuff. I just rewired a lamp. It took me a really long time. So... Uh, I, a couple of comments I want to make. Um, thank you, first of all, Ms. Chung and students and Mr. Martini who are here. Thank you so much. You're really inspiring to us. Ms. Steinmetz, thank you. My son had Ms. Steinmetz for a teacher and is now in his senior year at college with a job for next year. So thank you. That's a, a signal to all of the parents out there. She's magic. Um, couple of things. The Queer Center has been doing a lot of this work for some time. This is really, it's new in that you have a concentrated group of students, but the certification, the dual enrollment classes have been going on for some time, so you're building on expertise that is long lived at the Career Center. The dual enrollment classes are critical and very, very important. They are basically NOVA certified teachers who are teaching at the Career Center. And what parents need to understand is with this agreement, this articulated agreement with NOVA, NOVA then has that articulated agreement with every single four-year college in Virginia. And those colleges, through that agreement, must take those credits. So we are guaranteed, the students are guaranteed NOVA accepted credits, which are then guaranteed to be accepted in the four-year institution, be it UVA, James Madison, any of the, the uh, universities in Virginia, the public universities in Virginia. I will also mention having had one child go through the process of gaining uh, the acceptance of her NOVA classes in Maryland, they were quickly accepted the minute the, um, the class uh, curriculum was provided. So I say all that because this is not new, it's expanded, it's integrated, it's wonderful, but you have an amazing staff that's been doing this for some time, and I'm glad to see more and more students are able to do it. But for parents who really want to support their kids advancing as quickly as possible, there are kids who have already left the school system one and two years early with the college credits they needed to go into their sophomore year in college, which is really great for kids who want to Zoom through. It's also great for parents in terms of the cost of, of higher education. So. I wanted to make that point because you've got a Thank great you. foundation there. Okay, great. And um, I have uh, a, a few miscellaneous questions based on kind of follow-ups of other people's comments. But uh, first, again, thank you very much, especially to the students. Um, really terrific presentation. And um, it's, it's really great to have, to, to have that experience as an ambassador, a program like this that, you know, part of what you take on when you take on a new program is an innovative program is you have to be an ambassador. 
and that's tremendous experience. It's, it's really um, you know, just another way to grow. Um, so easy question, the back to school breakfast, just for those watching who I know are very enthusiastic at this point and can't wait to learn more, I assume that's open to the public, not just families of current students. You would like to, to share what's, what's happening all across the Career Center at that, it's yes. this Saturday, 9.30 to noon, I think? At the, till 12.30. 9.30 to 12.30 at the Career mm -hmm. Center. So, so yes. everyone, please come out to that. Um, I have heard through the grapevine that you all have your first sports team. <laughs> it is ultimate, yes. The Arlington Tech, is it, is it yes. Arlington yeah. Tech ultimate Frisbee team? Yes. That is really great. <laughs> and, and honestly, you know, as we expand, we need to know that all students are having opportunities. And I know, I think you still have the option of going back to your home school for yes. sports, but in the long run, as we expand to that many students, we have to make sure that we're providing programs in-house. And I, I, I'm sure that's the first of many, but it's exciting that we're getting started with that. Yes. So, yeah. Um, a quick follow-up about the capacity um, uh, numbers. And um, I just wanted to make this comment that I feel like the fact that we're building, you know, doing another project there and building more seats actually gives uh, us flexibility to allow Arlington Tech to grow organically whether it grows beyond your expectations or less because we're going to have to do well if it grows beyond our expectations we'll just fill the whole thing if it doesn't we'll do something else but it really gives us a, 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 the capability of, of saying we'll we'll work with that we'll see how Arlington Tech grows and we'll if we need to do more at that site we will um, so I, to me, I think this it really gives us some flexibility, a little bit of, of, of comfort with our, with our numbers. So, um, I wanted to follow up on the questions or the comments about dual enrollment and Nova. You have a lot of those courses. I know we offer them at the different high schools. Um, at this point, who's how is this happening? Um, are, is is the the career center? Are those courses different than the others, or it, who's, who's the center of all this, and, and how is this? How, how are we developing these dual enrollment courses, and how are we? What's, do we have a plan for for building? So there are some courses that are at Arlington Tech that are also at some of the other schools. We have an MOU with Nova um, that spells out which of the courses are that we offer, and we every year kind of look at where are we and what are our needs and so we've expanded some courses this year at some of the high schools i believe we have a science course at wakefield this year um, that's new as well as a couple of other ones so every year when we do the program of studies we're looking at what we're offering through aps we're also looking at the dual enrollment and seeing where is their interest and what are the um, courses that we'd like to expand upon or add on or you know, there's a huge enrollment at one school, and we think there's the demand at the other. So it's part of our program of studies process um, okay. so that we evaluate. And then we have an MOU with NOVA. Okay. All right. Um, my other questions, and I don't know if, um, I think they're a little bit more about STEM. Are we having a separate STEM update, or is it all part of tonight? So. Because they're sort of about the robotics classes, computer science, mm -hmm. and other things we have going. Should we go into that? Or? There are elements of STEM that we're going to be weaving into a lot of our monitoring reports this year because of where they fit. Um, so we're also doing some student showcases and things where we're going to be looking at some of our STEM work. But as we do like mathematics updates because of the math part of STEM, as we do um, some of our other content areas when we do science, we'll be hitting on that. So it'll come up in various monitoring reports throughout the course of the year. Okay. Well, let, let me toss these out. Sure. And this may be, you know, I didn't send these in advance. Um, I'm curious. Yeah, I, it dawned on me. I don't think, you know, we, we adopt the program of studies every year and, you know, we added robotics. I think mm -hmm. we've added computer science at the middle school level. And I'm not sure we've ever had updates on how those are going. Has it been two years that we've had some of those courses? Last um, year was just the first for robotics. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This I, was I, the first I, I would appreciate a brief update on, on oh, some of those courses and how they're going and whether how we're staffing them. Okay. Um, the computer science classes are going very well. Um, we have computer science classes at the middle school. Yes, at each of the middle schools. Um, and this is the second year that we've done that. Um, um, 
I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, but I can make sure that you have those um, on how they've gone from first year to second year. Um, but it looks like there has been some growth in that. Um, we have some seventh graders that have taken that computer science, and what we've done is they've um, given them the opportunity to take the, the uh, robotics this year because that has some coding in it as well. So that's been kind of a nice fit and a nice match. Um, this year we have um, robotics at um, Williamsburg, Swanson. We have one robotics class at Gunston. Um, we have robotics at Kenmore. Um, and I believe we have one at Jefferson. So at each of the middle schools, we have the robotics class as well. And um, numbers on that would be approximately, and I can get exact ones for you, but um, we have, let's see, probably about, um, maybe about 120 students total, total in yeah. the county. Yeah. Um, I, if not, I, just a little bit more. Um, yeah, I know we've been uh, making sure that they have all of the VEX robotics tools. All of our teachers have gone to training this summer, uh, so we had some of them for the um, for Project Lead the Way uh, for the robotics. Each of them went to that. We also had the digital electronics, which is part of that as well, um, and then we had some at Carnegie Mellon uh, that did some of the robotics classes, and we're hoping to have the Carnegie and Mellon person come down next summer for our Virginia. Uh, Virginia Technology and Engineering Association, which we're helping to host with Alexandria here so that our, that our teachers can take advantage of that as well. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And when and, you get a chance to send the actual right. numbers. And we hope to great. have um, students coming and showing some of the robotics as we kind of okay. move through the school year so you can see what they're doing and kind of get an idea of some of the activities that they're doing within the class and the robotics, the robots they're building. That'd be great. Yes. Yeah. We look forward to that. Thank you so much. This is obviously a a, a, a program that we're big fans of and you know we spent a little extra time on it but thank you so much thank you especially to the students you got some homework to get to so yes. <laughs> thank you guys thank you all thank so you. much for coming oh, yeah. we have swag yeah. <laughs> oh swag all right now there is a note that you have to take by doing the uh, okay. IMC Oh, we're voting. We're voting. Oh, um, priorities. We'll take well, a break. If you'd we'll like to take the oath, I'd like to yield very quickly. Yeah. If you want to yeah. raise your hands and, uh, oh, would you say an extra? <laughs> so you're, are you ready for the oath? Okay, ready for the oath? I state your name. I state your name. We'll, we'll pr uh, promote career and technical education to the citizens of Arlington. It's your we'll promote on, yeah. career and technical education to the citizens of Arlington. I will tell them about the validated skills the students learn in the classes. I will tell them about the validated skills the students learn in the classroom. The career exploration and creative and innovative uh, thinking they use daily. The career. Career exploration. Exploration. And creative and, and, and innovative and thinking. And creative and innovative thinking that they, they learn. It, daily. That they use daily in the classroom. Right. And that they will graduate college and career ready. And that they would graduate college and career ready. Excellent. All Thank right, you. wear your shirt proudly. Thank you. Thank you all so much. We're just taking a short break, just because our meeting got a little long. Yeah, just to, so we're going into action items, and some board members wanted a quick break, and we can't vote without them. So um, everyone just take a moment, check your phones. We'll be back with you shortly. Oh. Dr. Murphy, you had a comment you wanted to make, and I think I let everyone leave. Okay.
Oh. <laughs> Okay, folks, uh, we're, we're back online here, and um, we are going to move on to our action items. Our first action item is the school board's 2017-2018 priorities. Um, they, the, the topics are listed up on the screen on this slide. I do want to point out, and I, I, think, I think we have speakers before we vote. Um, I, that nothing has changed since what we, when we saw them for information. The document is the same. I'd like to remind everyone that our priorities refer to the work that the school board is focused on this year, the stuff that we actually have, have to like, you know, do and, and grind through day to day. At, in the document, the opening paragraph talks about our ongoing work. And it's important to remember that our school board priorities are different than what we're doing day to day in our schools and our classrooms. That work is going on. Every child is, is, is um, getting support. Um, we're looking for ways if they need interventions. Um, we're constantly working as hard as we can. And as a school board, we have prioritized things like literacy and the achievement gap, and we have provided resources and done a lot of work. That does go on uh, day to day. So when you look at our priorities list, it's a subset of all the different things we're doing in our schools. That doesn't mean we're not doing the other things. It means these are the things that, that we're working on day to day. A very simple example is um, the presentation we just had on Arlington Tech, which was a priority last year. We have not listed it as a priority this year because we've set it in motion. It's, it's, it's growing. Um, we've um, spent a lot of time getting it to where it is, and now we're monitoring it, and we're continuing to pay attention to it, um, but it's not a new priority. It's something that we've set in motion and are continuing. So I just want to clarify that this is not a complete list of everything we care about in our schools. This is a list of what we have to focus on to move our school system forward. Um, and with that, uh, can we first ask if uh, Ms. Mercado, or do we have speakers? Yes, there's one speaker. Okay. And Ms. Ingrid Gatt. Good evening. To Dr. Cannon, members of the school board, superintendent, and the executive leadership team, and all assembled, my name is Ingrid Gant. I am the president of the Arlington Education Association, speaking on behalf of our members. You know, I said I wasn't going to tell anybody, but I just couldn't keep this to myself. We are definitely hopeful as we witness the school board's priorities going forward and anticipate the good work that's currently being done. And Dr. Cannon has already said that what we see here has not been um, a snapshot of what we're doing daily. But as we look at the one-to-one -one initiatives, please keep in mind that many instructional and resource assistants still don't have the tools they need to carry out the lesson plans daily. Simply put, when the teachers are absent, they're not able to utilize any technology to carry out those plans. When things come from teachers and they're pushed to students to accomplish what's needed in the classrooms, those very assistants are still not able to follow those lessons and prepare to assist those students. And we do know that it's a budgetary item, and we're here to offer any solutions that you may need to assist in making that happen. Also, supporting and empowering our teachers and staff is something you as a school board members have proven, and we say thank you. The AEA looks forward in this commitment as you boost morale by allowing those you hired to do a job and do what they do best. So going forward, we're saddened that at this time, this same message is not being duplicated throughout our faculty meetings in the schools. Um, bullets are being deleted, and we solicit your guidance and support for this pertinent information that we're seeing here going forward, and we thank you in advance for all you do. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are ready for a motion. I move the board approve the school board's 2018 priorities. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Oh. Oh. Well, I'm not sure. Did everyone? Did everyone vote? We we yeah. Sorry. Um, I didn't know people wanted to discuss. We usually jump right in. But yes, if you had a comment, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say one thing before we vote. Um, most of these priorities have uh, some kind of measurable um, outcome indicator related to them. We're going to know. Uh, you know, for instance, what, that we've adopted an acceptable use policy or that the strategic plan is rolling because we know what the um, uh, 
uh, activity steps are through that. Um, the bottom, the engagement ones, support and empower and strengthen, um, I, I would like us to, when we do those, try and do them in a way that um, is measurable so that we can say at the end of the year, yes, we did, you know, X, Y, and Z. We didn't just, you know, strengthen in a general way or support in a general way, but we took these actual steps. So, thank you. Okay. Um, and I do want to mention, um, to clarify, there are actually two different versions of this slide, and um, the sequence is that this, the, 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 the upper four boxes of this slide were actually developed as part of our planning process. It was, it was used in our August work session as we discussed all our different um, processes we had going on. Um, I sort of liked the fact that it basically got at almost all our priorities and um, we in our school board office added the pink box to say, and now this really lists all of our priorities. So there are actually two different versions of the slide that, that may be floating around and being used in different, for different purposes. But you are correct that for the, the priorities, this is the, this is the full list. So with that, now everyone I think is ready to vote. So let's, let's do that again. All right, I think we can do that. Um, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes four to zero. Um, our next item is a proposed architectural and engineering services for Gunston HVAC modernization. Dr. Murphy, do you have additional information on this item? Yes, we do. And uh, is this going to be uh, Mr. Chambers or Mr. Blorsted? Mr. Blorsted, if you wouldn't mind uh, providing the additional information uh, regarding. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Good evening, Mr. Borstead. <laughs> we brought this to you last time uh, uh, to uh, approve the fees for this, and we realized, finance realized, that we had omitted to uh, inform you what is written in the bold paragraph here, um, that, in fact, we've already um, spent 493000 uh and $22 in pre-design work, and that we're about to spend another $192,000 in order to uh, keep the heating system going this winter, which is to replace the, bowl, the uh, boilers. So in fact, bond funds are available for that work, and it was anticipated, but we needed, needed to inform you uh, formally that the total to date is over the $500,000 threshold, that the school board is required to, uh, or we're required to, required to bring to the school board for approval. So that's okay. essentially an update as a result of what's happened with the boilers uh, in, in the interim. Yes, it was an omission on our part. We should have brought this to you uh, when we brought it to you for information, um, but we weren't looking at the whole Don't project at that me. point. So I apologize for not bringing it to you sooner. Okay, thank you. Ms. Mercado, do we have any speakers? No speakers. No speakers. Um, board colleagues, I see some questions emerging. Ms. Van Doren. Uh, will the real Mr. Boardstead, no, I'm just kidding, answer this. Mr. Chadwick, can you answer this question for me? So the amount we were considering was the $547.6 million for the HVAC actual installation. The 493 was the pre-design work, and the 192 is additional. So is the total amount... One point some odd million dollars that we're spending. Yes. So some of that is in design fees, and some of that is in actual construction. Ha we've already expended that four hundred ninety-three. Um, we've um, spent some of it. Yes. I I would have to get back to you on exactly how much of that's been. Was spent. that money already budgeted? I'm trying to figure yes, out. Yes. It, it, yes. It has all been already budgeted, um, and we're just bringing it to you to show you what the total is. So there are no projects that we are not doing because Absolutely of this. Absolutely not, no. This is money, maintenance, it has funds been that we would have done anyway. Exactly. It has been planned to be spent on Gunston. And because, as in many of these HVAC replacement projects, we can't get it all done in one summer, which we would really like. And obviously we can't interrupt operations at the school because lost school time is not uh, an option. We have to do it in pieces and in phases, and that is 
why we're bringing it to you this so way. So this was allocated. We were going to do it, but because it goes over the half million dollar threshold, you needed to come for our approval at this time. Exactly. And nothing is being supplanted by this project. Nothing is being supplanted. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. And just to be clear, um, bond funds are available, meaning they've already been uh, voted on and approved. Yes, they've been allocated for that purpose. Okay. Uh, th this isn't for upcoming bond funds oh, or no, something no, like that? Oh, no, no, Okay, thank you. If there are any more questions? Um, if not, um, may I have a motion? So moved. Or uh, do you have a motion? motion? Yes, oh, I have a yeah. motion. I move that the board approve the proposed architectural and engineering services for the Gunston Middle School HVAC modernization to 2RW Consultants Incorporated. Is there a second? Second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes four to zero. That is it for our action items. We will now move on to information items. We have four information items, and thank you all very much for your patience in sticking with us this evening. Um, the first item is our school board's 2019 budget direction, and I believe I'm discussing our budget direction. Do we, are we able to put the document up, Ms. Mercado? Um, I don't think so. I think I can do it from here. Um, really just want to summarize this very briefly. I'll read the opening sentence, which should basically um, summarize what we're up to here. The school board directs the superintendent to prepare an FY 2019 budget that continues to support our high quality 27,000 student school system while also developing strategies to ensure long-term sustainability. As we go down in the documents to the bullet points, if you could scroll down a little bit, Ms. Mercado, to the bullet points, yes. Um, basically, yeah, right there. What we're asking for is a budget that, of course, the first bullet um, gets at continuing to support our high-quality system and um, budget that is consistent with our mission, vision, core values, and strategic plan. Um, as per policy, we would like to include the employee step increase. Um, we have to support our growth. We would like to continue with the initiatives we began in the last uh, budget year and, and two budget years ago. Um, that includes salary in, increase for our um, lowest paid um, employees. And we, um, but we recognize that we do need to bring a sustainable budget and we are asking the superintendent to attempt to reduce per pupil spending or, and or develop long-term strategies to reduce per pupil spending across future budget years. Um, we are continuing to grow. Our budget will continue to grow, um, but we're, we would like to try to keep it from um, um, that growth um, at, a, at a fairly stable level. We are um, going to be opening new schools in the next few years and many, many cost pressures that we're facing. Um, so this is uh, our draft budget direction. There are a few more bullet points below that are a little bit more boilerplate about using advisory committee recommendations, um, looking for efficiencies. This gives the superintendent a lot of flexibility. We don't say where to look for those efficiencies. We're charging um, uh, him and his staff to help us with that and also, to, of course, to be looking um, forward and forecasting um, revenues ex expenditures over the next three years so that we can gauge how we're doing in terms of sustainability. Um, that's a very quick summary. Board, uh, Ms. Mercado, any speakers on this item? Yes, we have one speaker, Ms. Ingrid Gant. Okay, thank you. Good evening, protocol already being established. I am speaking on behalf of Mr. Josh Fobe, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, he is uh, adherent to Rosh Hashanah, and so he sends his regards. Um, he says, good evening, the Arlington Education Association appreciates that the budget direction directs the superintendent to include step increases in the fiscal year 2019 budget. However, silent from the budget direction is a plan to address cost of living adjustments. The AEA Compensation Committee has been advocating for many years for APS to decide on an index, be it in the Consumer Price Index or Social Security Index, increase just to name a few, and use that index when determining if staff should receive a COLA. Using an objective matrix or metric, we will have far-reach advocacy power in, the, in this community and with the county board. Rents continue to rise in Arlington and leave employees on their own to absorb these costs. It's unfair. Further, APS should not cower behind the compensation study to determine if employees should get a COLA. 
I would remind all assembled that the compensation study was to address pay scales that were woefully behind, not to determine merit, steps, or cost of living increases. The AA Compensation Committee clearly understands, as many of you said, we can't keep shaking a tree and expecting to get increases. Yet we can't forget about our dedicated eligible employees who continue to receive no increases from year to year. Please add or think about an additional bullet to direct the superintendent to determine an appropriate index for the Washington region and use it to determine how much an annual COLA should be. Respectively submitted, Josh Fogue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, board colleagues, any comments or discussion or questions? Anything? Hearing none, we'll go on to the next item. Um, which is the process to, de to develop criteria for the APS naming policy, 50-1.10. Dr. Murphy. Yes. Yes, we had some discussion <laughs> about this uh, item a little bit earlier with the start of the school year, and at that time, uh, the board directed me to come back with some additional information about a process for us to be able to move forward. Uh, we have several new schools that we are going to need to consider. Uh, the naming process with. So this begins sort of the uh, foundational work that Ms. Ertis is going to talk through and lead us through as far as how it proceeds through the rest of this year. So Ms. Ertis, I'll turn to you. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. And I'm waiting for Jeremy to do his magic in the booth. Um, this is the last. We should have the naming. Can you email it to him very quickly? We, should we switch Let the me, order? Uh, if you want me to step back and we can switch order and pull that up, he should. I think it. rather than waiting, why don't we jump okay. to this item and okay. hopefully and I'll make sure he has will it. email the PowerPoint to Jeremy. We'll get it up. Terrific. So good news for those who are waiting to be uh, to speak on the next item. We're, <laughs> we're jumping. Oh, <laughs> everyone, everyone good? With going to the next item? Yeah. Okay. Um, All right, so I'll next. turn to Mr. Chadwick then. We'll yes. move right to the charge uh, to the building level planning committee for the new elementary school at Reed. And then uh, John, I'll assume we'll just go ahead and follow with the contract award for the architectural and engineering services. Mr. Chambers is going to do that one. All right, well then you can introduce him. I will enjoy that. Good evening again. Um, Reed project. So it was included in the um, 2017 to 26, 2026 CIP that you approved in June of 16 uh, to create at least 725 seats to be completed in 2021, 2022. In other words, in time for in fall of um, 2021. And uh, the total cost would be a maximum of 49 million, and I'm emphasizing maximum. Uh, we have a policy implementation procedure, 50-1.2. Uh, as you know, we are in the process of revising our, our policies and PIPs that, uh, all through the system, the division, um, but the ones relating to design, construction, and planning are, quite, are on the agenda now. So um, the remainder of the um, charge, which is kind of long for this one, is uh, reflective of the draft PIP that we will be bringing to you later in the year. And the draft PIP was, in fact, um, prepared a little while ago based on a lot of experience that we'd um, had with previous BLPCs. So it reflects the knowledge and then some new direction from the school board. Um, we are not, however, making any changes to the stakeholder groups who would, or not proposing any changes to the stakeholder groups who would take part. So we have parents and PTAs from um, five schools. We have civic associations from Highland Park, Overly Knolls, Westover Village, Tara Leeway Heights. And we have recently uh, received a request for, um, I believe it's Madison Manor, and the name is escaping me of the other one. Dominion, Dominion Hills, thank you. Um, and we will be reaching out to them. And there is one other, looking at the um, civic association map, there is one more that we're going to recommend reaching out to which is uh, overly, thank you. It, the names are all almost the same. That's why he can't keep them straight. So um, we do believe that if a um, civic association has expressed a particular interest, that we should recognize that and invite them to join the committee. 
Um, the Advisory Council on School Facilities and Capital Programs, Public Facilities Review Committee. We are proposing on this one to um, act similarly as we did on uh, the fleet project. And so we will be aligning the BLPC and the PFRC and expecting to have every other meeting will be a joint meeting. And that the Civic Association members who are appointed um, project specific to the PFRC for a particular project we are working with the PFRC to have the same members appointed so that there is continuity between the BLPC and the PFRC with respect to civic associations. Student Advisory Board, um, Arlington Public Library staff, of course, will be part of it because the library is a part of the project. Department of Instruction staff um, and then Department of Facilities and Operations staff. Uh, we will also be having some uh, representation from uh, teachers in elementary schools since, of course, we don't have a school there yet. This is a new school. Primary role of the B BLPC is to serve as the principal communication liaison with the stakeholders. BLPC members are appointed to represent a stakeholder group, and we believe that their responsibility is to communicate with that group and bring the concerns, issues, and ideas of that group back to the BLPC in a two-way function. Um, we, APS staff, support the work of the BLPC. We're responsible for educational specifications, um, and that really is the way in which the instructional program is to be delivered in the school through spaces uh, in the school for cost control and for management of the schedule. Um, we have uh, received direction from the school board, um, and I will just outline that, that the new school at the Reed Building will be a neighborhood a, a elementary school with an attendance zone. So it will be a neighborhood school and not an option school. Uh, the, BL, the school board will appoint a chair to the BLPC. That has not um, generally happened in the past. Um, we have recommended that, and the school board is directing us to bring... Uh, to, to work with them to select a, a chair, to appoint a chair. Um, the BLPC will assist the school board to achieve strategic plan goal four, to provide optimal learning environments that are adaptable to future changes of use, are energy efficient, efficient environmentally sustainable, and provide adequate outdoor space for physical education and recess. The funding available for the project is the maximum available unless additional funding is approved by the school board. And every effort shall be made to control costs and to complete the project for less than $49 million, recognizing how many other seats we will need to build in the near future. Uh, the BLPC will participate primarily due, during the concept and schematic design phases when all the important decisions are made about how the um, addition in this case, or additions, um, relate to the site, what site amenities are provided, the massing of the building, adjacencies of major interior spaces and site amenities, community use of the building, uh, pedestrian and vehicular site circulation and parking, and impact of the project on the surrounding community. We'll collaborate with the design team and APS staff to develop three design options during the concept phase, which would represent a minimum, a mid-range, and maximum costs. And the maximum costs cannot be more than the $49 million, which you have approved for this project. And the um, chair will prepare a letter at the concept phase recommending one of those three options to the school board, um, that will then be completed for the school board to um, approve. Uh, they will do the same at the end of the schematic design phase. There are some milestone dates. We have already, uh, uh, we're already working on these dates. Every meeting will be scheduled um, at the rate of about two per month uh, in order to meet the uh, milestone deadlines so that we can get this school opened for uh, September of 2021, and we will be very mindful of the schedule given how some of the schedules have um, been extended, shall I say, on other projects. So March, 28, uh, March of 2018, we plan to bring the concept design to you for approval. July, we will bring the um, 
or end of June, we will bring the schematic design for approval. We um, hope to take the um, project to the county board for use permit approval in January of 2019. Um, construction would start in October of 2019 and in August 2021, we would receive our certificate of occupancy so that school can open uh, in September. So our recommendation is you approve the charge, membership, and appointment of the chair. Um, when we come back to you for information, uh, for action in two weeks' time, we will, we are already developing a list of names. We're still assembling names and we'll be working with you to um, identify the individuals who will be specifically appointed to the BLPC. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have speakers? Yes, we have two speakers. Okay. Mr. Chips Johnson. Good evening. Uh, I'm Chips Johnson, a resident of the Restover area and within sight of Reed School. Uh, the community is very mm -hmm. pleased with the, uh, the neighborhood school process. And from looking at this, the, uh, uh, Mr. Chadwick's uh, comments about having the uh, built into the process uh, some form of, of being able to adapt the school perhaps in the, in, in the future if, if things change is a great idea. Uh, we hear this you know, already in the, uh, the present facility. Uh, it goes back to an elementary school, which it was in, in 1984. Uh, some people were still you know, grinding over that, and that's fantastic now that we have another elementary school. Um, the uh, difference between now and 1984 is that now the, uh, the commercial business area is booming with all kinds of traffic and, and parking and, and everything. That's great because the traffic brings customers. The customers pump up the use and the uh, effectiveness of the businesses. Uh, the bad news is now with an elementary school coming in with 725 students and with a parents and with all the kinds of other transportation, tra uh, trucking and so forth associated with the school, we're going to have a big problem there. Uh, the, the merchants are already you know, at risk because of the, uh, the parking turnover and so forth. Uh, what we'd like to see is um, the uh, merchants beyond the BLPC uh, in some form of membership because they have a, an interest, uh, there's a financial and economic uh, functional uh, responsibility uh, that's, that's inherent with what goes on in the uh, Westover area. And we really need to have some, uh, somebody like that at the, uh, at the table. Uh, we could lose a lot of businesses if we lose all the, the, uh, the traffic to the businesses. The next speaker is Mr. Robert Sweens. Good evening. I'm uh, appearing before you sort of wearing two hats. One is for the Leeway Overly Civic Association, and the second one is for Field to Table Incorporated, and I'll explain what those are. I was happy to hear the comment that probably Leeway Overly would be uh, getting representation on that board. Uh, you probably don't need them, but I did bring with me copies of our last Civic Association newsletter, and there is an article about uh, the, the uh, planning committee for Reed School in that, uh, in that publication, and we do it almost every, every issue because it is critical to our, to our neighborhood. Most of our, our households are, are below Lee Highway, between Lee Highway and Washington Boulevard, so a lot of the students, a lot of the children living there probably will be in this school. So uh, secondly, Field to Table uh, holds the use permit for the Westover Farmer's Market. And the Westover Farmer's Market has been now on the Reed site for the past six years. I happen to be the manager of the Westover Farmer's Market. And we are very concerned about ensuring that the design of the new school doesn't inadvertently impact negatively on the Farmer's Market. We have 30 vendors in the market. It's a year-round market. It draws a lot of people throughout the county. And so what I would recommend, uh, the two sort of recommendations, one is to have a representative from Leeway Overlay beyond the uh, BLPC, and secondly, have a representative from Field to Table to be on the BLPC, because our primary concern is the exterior of the building. 
we're not as concerned with the interior at all, but the exterior and the layout, so it doesn't adversely affect us. Thank you. Okay, okay great. Um, board colleagues, comments, questions, discussion? Mr. Goldstein? Um, and it was appointing the committee on oh yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, John we're anticipating that the committee would be appointed at the next meeting at the same time that the same meeting that we would be um, approving the charges and action item yes um, but we have done rolling appointments to BLSBCs in the past, so it's perfectly possible to add other um, representatives of other stakeholder groups as we move forward. Okay, and do you have a, I don't know if you mentioned this, a um, notional timeline of when that BLPC would get started with their work? Yeah, we will start in October. Okay. I don't have an exact date. Um, we have a draft, but we haven't confirmed it. Okay, thank you. And just to remind everyone, we will have a joint work session with the county board on October 17th, right, at the Reed Building. Um, and that will be, I think, at 6 p.m. And um, at that point, that, that's kind of the launch of the BLPC-PFRC process. We will be discussing this project with the county board, um, and we'll also discuss some of our other projects, but this is the main topic of that, of that joint work session. Um, just want to mention for fun, I used to live in the Leeway Overly uh, Civic Association. I recognize that you have the same format of the newsletter. It used to be exactly like that when I lived there. That's really great. And it is true that most of that civic association is walking distance to this, to this school. So and I did to, check. It does start at 6. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, think, I think there is definitely interest in being inclusive with the civic associations. Just one point um, from the presentation that I wanted to... Um, discuss with my colleagues before we uh, uh, take this to action in two weeks, which was the chair recommending. Um, you mentioned that we're asking this BLPC, this is new, to ask them to look at kind of a low, middle, high cost option, co cost options. Um, and you mentioned that the chair would then recommend one of those. I actually wonder if, I, I think we're kind of setting the chair up to say that he or she would recommend the high cost option. <laughs> um, so I, I wonder if maybe we want to ask the chair for thoughts and you know pros and cons, but not to actually bring a recommendation. Maybe that's something we can discuss. Um, and and if, if, if we decide to do that, I think we would just simply do the revision and it would be posted on, on board docs as a slightly revised charge. Was, was there a comment on that? Um. Presumably, the, um, the, the, it wouldn't be just the chair. The chair would be reflecting the consensus of the committee. Yes. But at the same time, the committee's recommendation wouldn't necessarily be the same as staff's recommendation. So wouldn't we be hearing from staff at the same time when the committee would say, we recommend this, but staff would say, well, for our own but reasons, we have Mr. Chadwick comment. agree or disagree? Um, I think the answer is yes. Well, staff will definitely make a recommendation, and I agree it's appropriate that we not put the um, BLPC in that position of re being forced to recommend the high one. So um, asking them to uh, provide comments on what's being presented to them sounds very sensible to me. And, and that is probably, uh, actually, these are all things that we will incorporate into the revised PIP when we, when we get to it. Um, I think Dr. Murphy had a quick so I want to uh, roll the uh, clock back a little bit with all the discussions that we've had for the last several years about cost and the need for additional seats. And this is actually something that the board directed me to bring forward with future projects that we look at the reality that uh, not only this project, but future projects, we are going to have to make sure that we have the resources and the funding to be able to do that. Uh, typically what we get, in all honesty, is we get the maximum number. Let's have an honest conversation here about what's happening. So this system allows us to be able to devise uh, the reality of the community having some input about some of those choices and then perhaps guiding staff's work to help the board make that final decision. 
I think it's important for me there to put that um, front and center uh, before we begin the process because that's going to be really important to folks' work as far as how we continue to meet our capacity needs and then what kind of facilities uh, we construct. And I think it's just important for us to remind that. It's something that I've talked to Mr. Chadwick about. And I think it's really inherent in the process that sometimes we wind up with situations where projects either meet or, in fact, exceed because we have the reality of fluctuating construction costs uh, when we go out to bid that we may have to then come back and say that we have to go to the lower bid project to, so that we meet the, um, the funding. So not a conversation everyone likes to have. We want to make sure we have all of the, the resources and the, um, the supports in place. But on the other hand, we do have limited resources, and it's got to be an honest conversation that we have as a yeah. community. I, I think it's a great idea. I mean, it, it allows us to ask the community how to make those trade-offs instead of us ultimately having to do it if the bid comes in too high. So uh, Ms. Van Dorn. I want to comment on the low, medium, and high. Lower cost, medium cost, high cost does not mean a difference in quality. Uh, what we need to put forward are options at various levels, and it may be that the lower cost is actually the more appealing in this situation. And we really have to get our minds around this. If we're always presuming and thinking we're gaming the system to come up with the we know we're going to end up with the high cost, but let's put the other two in there, then we shouldn't bother. I think with this has to be serious because every time we are able to save some money on a project, we are then able to ensure that we can build more seats faster in the future. And we have so many, as Mr. Landry keeps saying, we can't build our way out of this. But if we are really cost conscious in a way that allows us to bring seats on economically, high quality seats, but economically, we can build more seats. And we really have to do that. So we, I, I cannot stress that, how disappointed I will be if those three options aren't really valid, viable options. Because it may very well be that the community prefers the lower cost option, which then lets us go further faster. So please, I implore you, Less expensive doesn't mean less quality or less good. It just means it's a different option with a lower price tag. And I think that may work. And I think we just really need to press ourselves to do that. So the direction was not a game, as, Mr., uh, as Dr. Murphy has uh, pointed out. This is serious because we really need to build more seats. And we really can do it. I was just looking at the plan in Montgomery County for a 2,400-seat high school, the largest one they've ever built for $130 million. That's a lot of money, but it's, it's, it's certainly less per student than, than what we've been doing. So I don't know their parameters. It, things are very complicated now in Arlington because there's limited space. We're going to be building in different ways. We're going to be building up. We're going to be putting parking garages, probably in everything we build from now on. I really understand that, but that's why we really have to get at it this way because we have additional costs given where we are, and we need to be innovative, and we need to be cost conscious, and let's win an award for that. Thank you. Did Mr. Goldstein, you had a comment? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I'm a little confused by the last conversation. So you're, adv you're both advocating that the community bring forward uh, uh, thoughts Recommendations. Let me on no, let me. No, Mr. Goldstein. What I'm saying is that the the uh, staff is task is tasking. We have in the um, as I see to the architect that they need to bring that forward. The community will be reviewing it, and then they will be commenting on the options that are provided by the architect. The the BLPC will be uh, commenting on those options. Is that what you mean? Yes, and I also presume staff will have a recommendation from those. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. Uh, we're good? Okay. Um, sh shall we go on with our construction items, yeah. Dr. Murphy? Yes. And, and yes, let's go ahead and finish up. Uh, we've okay. got architectural and engineering services, and I believe Mr. Chambers is going to do that one. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Uh, and board. <clears throat> um, I'm going to be talking about the contract award for the architectural engineering services of the new elementary school at Reed, which may answer some of those questions that we just were discussing. Um, uh, Mr. Chadwick went through the project overview, but just very briefly, 
this was included in the CIP, the 2017 uh, to 2026 CIP um, to create uh, 700, at least 20, 725 seats at the Reed School uh, to be completed by the 2021-22 school year at a maximum cost of $49 million. The preliminary schedule that we're currently uh, looking at is with design and permitting from October of 2017 to September of 2019 and construction uh, October 2019 through um, to July of 2021 with occupancy in 2021 uh, for the fall uh, school year. Uh, and then a post-occupancy evaluation uh, would be um, completed by 2022. Uh, and in the proposal, we have listed for the design team to pr be providing low, medium, and high cost design alternatives. And these were discussed with them that the design alternatives have to be working alternatives. Basically, there may be features that are desired through the BLPC process that get added that will be in the high project cost and maybe won't be, uh, will be an option, so to speak. It's like buying a car with um, different options that you get in. You might like the car that's in the middle mid price of that model, but you could get other features if you decide that you want them. And that's what we're going to be looking at and how we'll be looking at it, not as something that, you know, you really don't want this low feature job because it's not going to serve the students and it's not going to be what you need. So that is in the documents, they will be providing that. Uh, it was a competitive uh, selection process and probably one of the most competitive since I've been involved. Um, selection committee did include APS staff from departments of instruction and facilities. Uh, the selection process comprised qualifications of interview. There were actually 16 proposals received. That's a lot of reading. So a lot of people put a lot of sweat and, and time into this. There were four firms interviewed. Uh, usually we try to do two or three. Um, there were four that we, we felt were fully qualified, but one firm was unanimously supported by the selection committee as the most qualified uh, and happens to be a firm that, that actually has done a lot of work in Arlington as well as for uh, APS. Uh, and that firm is VMDO, uh, who was involved with the Discovery Project and currently the uh, Fleet uh, Elementary School at TJ. Uh, so we feel very strongly and comfortable with them, and they are fully embracing the low, medium, and high uh, costing uh, as another challenge uh, with the other challenges that they look for, uh, forward to. Um, we're looking, the recommendation is to approve a contract award in the amount of $4,422,654 to VMDO Architects. This includes services provided during the uh, BLPC uh, design process, construction, post occupancy evaluation. It's, it's very, a very complete proposal uh, that we have received from them. Um, we're looking at utilizing, uh, recommending to utilize $4 million in capital reserve. Uh, project funds identified in the 2017-26 CIP uh, for the design phase expanses until the future bond funds are available following the 2018 referendum. Uh, we did a lot of evaluation of the costs. We believe it is, is fair and reasonable for the scope uh, that is expected. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any speakers? Okay, questions, comments? Anyone? Ms. Van Doren? Are you going to be including any looks at prefabricated uh, school uh, buildings? Is this going to be part of it, is, or is that something that architects could bring to you? Because I do know that in neighboring jurisdictions, that's been one way to contain costs. And uh, I'm wondering if that's within the scope of that or not. It, it could very well be. Um, we, we haven't limited them to anything, and that may be a possibility. I am very familiar with the prefabricated that are, that are built out of sight because it's a lower construction cost and you bring the pieces in and, and assemble them. Um, in fact, in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, there's about three plants that actually do schools, mostly for New York City. And I've toured those, and I understand. Great. I'll just say, having um, been the liaison, school board liaison to, to Fleet Elementary mm -hmm. and working with VMDO, I can certainly assure the community um, they're very responsive, creative, um, great problem solvers, and I am sure that when they, they're embracing, they, they, they love a challenge. So if the, the low, and medium, it, and high... And it is the same leadership. Yes, fantastic, fantastic. They're, they're uh, really going to be a pleasure to work with again, I'm sure. 
Uh, so I think we're done with that item for now. And again, we vote on this as well as the charge of the BLPC as well as the, the membership on October 5th, next school board meeting. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Appreciate it. We have one final item with a PowerPoint. So uh, Dr. Murphy. All right, and we're coming back to you, Ms. Ertis, now that we've uh, found the PowerPoint. And yes. we're going to be discussing the first phase of the APS naming uh, policy. They had two, he had two copies of uh, Mr. Chadwick trying to elbow me out and none of mine, so we fixed that. Uh, good evening, board members. Uh, tonight, um, as Dr. Murphy said earlier, in August, the board um, asked us as we were beginning to look at um, the naming of facilities policy, board members asked us to look at developing clear naming criteria to include as part of the policy revision. So tonight, uh, as, as you know, we've discussed this over the last month or so, tonight I'm going to present a proposed process for, the, for us to follow in the coming months to do that. Um, our current policy for naming of facilities really gives committees two guidelines. Um, one is that the, they are to be named according to the first one says geographical or historical relationships in which the site is located. Um, an example of that would be um, Carlin Springs being named for the geographic area. In cases where the name of an inv individual is proposed, the name shall be considered only after the individual has been deceased for five years. So those are the two pieces in the policy right now. The board has asked that we develop a process to more closely look at um, criteria and define it, um, give a little bit more um, direction. So what I'm going to present is sort of a four-phase process for you that we'd go through over the next few months. Phase one is to recruit and convene a staff naming policy review committee. We've discussed many um, options for this, but at this point we felt that staff could convene the group and uh, lead the process That's, um, for this. Uh, direction that we've received from the board is that it would be a diverse representation of APS staff. It would include staff members who grew up in Arlington, or our current residents and or APS grads, as well as those who are not. Um, it, we want to include representatives from all employee groups, so that would be teachers, administrators, staff, office staff, um, custodians, drivers, cafeteria workers, and include a cross-section of elementary, middle, and high school, and so forth for the membership of the committee. The first process the group would do, the staff group would do, is to research the derivation of all current APS school names so that we can sort of go through the list and, and define what the names are based on so that we have that as a basis. But probably the biggest um, uh, and largest amount of time will be spent on engaging um, APS staff members, our students, our families, um, school alumni, and community members. Um, through a variety of methods. Um, one um, uh, option, obviously, all of this information will be housed, like all of our other decisions, on the uh, Engage with APS section of the website. Um, we will most likely have a feedback form uh, for community members. Uh, we will be sharing the information, as we are with everything else, with our school ambassadors for them to encourage PTAs and families to share their feedback or ideas. Um, we've discussed hosting some opportunities for facilitated community conversations um, during the process with the community. And then to solicit feedback from the, um, all of the board committees um, and groups, the student advisory board, the school board advisory committees, and the superintendent's advisory committees. Um, the staff committee's goal is to complete its work for phase one uh, close to the end of the current um, calendar year. That would be, this is a school year, I apologize, late in 2017. But I can say that if it looked like the staff needed more time, we would come to the Dr. Murphy and, and the board to let you know what we think um, it is so that you could adjust your calendars. The staff committee will then, based on the feedback they've heard, the research they've done, they may look at other policies that school districts or other places use um, or criteria to develop 
dra wording for draft naming criteria which will be included in the school and facility naming policy that we currently have. Um, as we've discussed, the draft criteria would reflect the APS mission, vision, and core values. Um, it would provide clear or clearer guidance to direct all future community conversations for school naming uh, processes. Uh, the staff committee, last part of their work, um, being finished, they would move on to phase two, and that really is presenting or putting together a staff proposal um, after they review and, and engage, they'll uh, present the draft naming criteria recommendations to the school board. Um, the staff committee will be prepared because we expect the board, once um, draft naming criteria are presented, to say, well, what does this mean for Arlington Public Schools? So. Obviously, the staff committee needs to be prepared to identify which names of APS schools, if any, may need to be considered for renaming uh, based on their draft uh, proposal. Um, and that staff identification would be based solely on their draft, and it's not, um, put, does not put anything in stone because it's only a draft. Um, that's phase two. Phase three then is in the board's hands. Obviously the school board, before making any decision, we know you're going to want to engage the community further for more feedback on the draft criteria and school facility naming policy. That can include a public hearing, um, email that you receive, uh, comments that you um, gather in open office hours and all of the meetings that you hold throughout the month actually and during the process with meetings with your liaison groups. Uh, based on that feedback, then, um, the second part of the board's um, work would be to finally adopt the revised school facility naming policy, which will include final wording for the school facility naming criteria. And that would be the criteria used for all future name, school naming and facility naming processes. Um, if needed at that time, and once the, the policy is adopted, then the school board um, would direct the superintendent to begin a renaming process for any school or schools that may need, uh, may need to be renamed so that it complies with the new school facility naming policy. Um, and then the final phase after the board has adopted um, the policy, the next steps, um, we have two facilities already underway. Um, the new middle school being built out at the um, current H.B. Woodlawn and Stratford program location. That middle school will need a, lay, uh, a name, and then the facility under construction on Wilson Boulevard also needs a name. So this revised policy would be used for those naming processes. Um, renaming process for any schools identified as part of phase three from the school board action. Um, could begin, and a, the, the timeline for that process can be determined by the board. Um, all naming processes will follow our standard procedures that are already outlined in the policy implementation uh, procedure, which, out, which outlines how the committee is put together, how they meet, how they do their work. And then finally, um, just as a reminder, the school board must approve all new or revise school names before they become official. And so that's the proposed process, and I'm happy to take questions. Terrific. Thank you. Do we have any speakers? Okay. Uh, board colleagues, questions or comments? Mr. Goldstein. I think I, <clears throat> I have one. Um, the phases, are they serial, or is there any overlap? It probably is to the extent in terms of engagement. For example, phase four can't happen until phase three happens. Okay, and the school board action is not going to happen, I don't believe, until you've done your further engagement. So there's that, and, and so forth. So going backwards, there's no um, artic um, reverse articulation. I would say, obviously, I would imagine the board will hear a lot of things from the community throughout the process, even though we have a specific timeline for staff to engage the community, and then another timeline for the board to engage the community. Um, that does not preclude um, your talking to the community, um, but you know that the rest of the process should go in order. But we'll be able to say 
these are phase one activities and now phase mm -hmm. one is over mm -hmm. and now we'll undertake phase two as right. defined by such right. and such and not start phase three before phase two is finished. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Van Dorn. I just want to say thank you. I know you've worked very hard on this and we've had a lot Thanks. of input into the process and I like the fact that we're taking baby steps toward this and being very, very thoughtful. So I just really want to thank you for doing that. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, okay. Nope. Similarly, okay. just a, a quick closing comment as well that, yeah, um, you have laid out what we promised, which was, which is a deliberate process. Mm -hmm. um, there are many points, if one goes and looks through those phases again, where we direct the superintendent, where we take action. So there are many moments mm -hmm. where it doesn't go on to that next phase unless we take right. action or we give direction. So, and by hitting, we hit those points after doing a lot of community engagement. So as promised, you know, we're being very deliberate. We're gonna be listening to community feedback at every stage. Um, and, you know, there's going to be a right. lot of, of excellent staff work done up front to really give us some of that background to really work with too. The history of the names yeah. and such. It's gonna be very interesting. Thank you. Um, very much appreciate it. We look forward to, to hearing next steps um, okay. when you're ready. Great. Uh, that closes off, I believe, our final uh, um, item for information. Is there any new business? And hearing none, we shall adjourn.